Welcome to Fat Man on Batman. I'm Kevin Smith. I'm Mark Bernard. Hey! What? Oh my God, we're back. It has been a red hot minute and stuff. Uh, to catch up, a few months ago, almost died. Now, still here. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've been uh, going out on tour. I've been doing a lot of shows on the road because after the heart attack, I was off the road for a little bit and stuff. So it was the kind of like, I'm not dead tour for the last month and stuff. <laughs> out in the world, uh, but um, what did I do just recently? I went to Vegas uh, this weekend. Um, real spur of the moment, man. Went to the Red Rock Casino, which is like 15 minutes away from the airport, um, which was really nice. Set up shop and worked on this project that like I can't say anything about, but I promise you it's fucking fantastic. It's not mine, it's for somebody else, uh, and it involves their IP and stuff. But uh, when I could tell you about it, first you're gonna be like, you? And then <laughs> you'll go, oh, I get it, kind of. But it is fucking phenomenal. So that's, I went to Vegas to do that, like to just, just fuck, put myself in a room and fucking work really hard and stuff, which sounds weird. You don't go to Vegas for that. But I, I, I was like, you know, I'll work and then when I'm free, I'll play cards. But all I did was work. Uh, I saw Tyler Heron, who's the production designer on, I met him on Flash. And then he, uh, he works on Supergirl now. Mm. And I was like, just meet me there and I'm gonna tell you this thing that I'm working on. And you know, while I do that, write it down. I just need somebody to fucking say it to. And he's a real good like story person and stuff. Also understands the episodic nature and budgets of episodic television. So it, it's, I chiefly went to Vegas uh, for that. But while I was there, I got to go see Penn and Teller. Um, who I've seen there in Vegas, yes, the great Penn and Teller, a few times. Over the course of my life, I've seen them live. I guess this was the fifth time. And Penn, uh, if, if, for anyone who's fo been following this story, Penn's book, Presto, was the one that I started reading right after my heart attack that I, made me lose weight. He was the one that introduced me to Ray Cronus and his uh, Just Sides diet, which kicks off with two weeks of just potatoes. People mistakenly call it the potato diet, and that irritates Ray. But uh, it, it was it was Penn's book that I was like, well, I'm gonna fucking do what Penn did. And the first two weeks, man, I've dropped a bunch of weight just eating potatoes and stuff. Then the diet became far more like uh, vegetable based, and I, I couldn't fucking go down that road and stuff. So now I'm with Weight Watchers. <laughs> uh, I'm a vegan, but I couldn't eat vegetables, so uh, I'm doing a different program. So, but it, it all began with with Penn's book. So when I was going to Vegas, I was like, hey man, are you guys doing the show? And, and he was coming to record a podcast in my house this week. So it worked out and I got tickets and we went to see the fucking show. Um, number one, if you've never seen Penn and Teller, I've been watching them since the, you know, the first time I saw them, I guess would be on SNL back in the early 80s. <clears throat> they did this amazing bit, captured my imagination, where they were on camera and they were doing levitation. They were standing at a counter and they would reveal things and then just let them go and they would fly into the fucking air. And the whole time they were doing this bit, you could hear the audience like laughing, like they were in on something that you weren't. And it was amazing, as you watch the trick, you're like, oh my God, they're really, they're, how the fuck are they doing it? There's no strings, they're just letting shit and it's going up in the air. And so by the end of the bit, like during the bit, they keep telling the audience like, uh, for the folks at home, so they know that we're not up to anything, to any trickery, we're gonna constantly yell, are we live? And the audience gonna yell, yeah. So they did it for like 10 minutes, it was fantastic. And then at the end of the bit, uh, they were just dropping like th huge things, levitating. First it was little dolls and then huge like bowling balls and shit like that. Camera pulls out and turns right side up and they've been upside down the whole fucking time just <laughs> dropping shit on the floor. <laughs> so right away I was like, I love these people. They're so fucking subversive. And so, you know, if you're unfamiliar with their act, uh, Penn is the very chatty one, and Teller doesn't speak. Sounds awfully fucking familiar. <laughs> so when I, whenever I go see a Penn and Teller show, it's not just me going, oh, I fucking love these dudes, they're geniuses at their craft. It's not just me going like, oh, I fucking uh, have been watching these guys for years, so it's nostalgic or sentimental as well. 
like whenever I go see them, I'm like, I probably owe them a percentage of everything I ever make, <laughs> particularly Teller, you know, alone. So I, I've known Penn and met Penn, and he's been on my house and we podcasted. But I've seen Teller, but I've never actually met Teller. Mm. So before the show, they were like, come backstage and say hi. There's a, for an hour before the show, Penn sits there and plays jazz with this other guy, just like free forms and shit like that. And then uh, after an hour of that, the show begins in earnest and stuff. So he said, come back, you know, after the jazz session and, and, and we'll chit chat and stuff. And so I met Teller and it was so fucked up because all he did was talk. And I meet so many people in life who are just like, oh my God, I didn't know you talked this much and shit like that. And I felt like hitting them with the same fucking line, but I had to bite my tongue because I'm like, you know you hate it when people say that shit to you, so don't say it to him. But it was so weird having a conversation with a guy who my entire fucking life of knowing him through his work, I've never seen him speak. Who talked first? Or did you have some kind of like samurai <laughs> silent <laughs> off? <laughs> I, I gotta be honest with you, dude. Like, during the show, I was watching him and realizing that, like, I took a lot of my shtick directly from him. He's wonderful at performing without fucking words and stuff. So it was pretty fun uh, to see the show, number one. But number two, to kind of be backstage with the two dudes without whom I don't get to my two dudes, probably. Whoa, what are these? Oh, water, thanks. Oh. And is that for you? An Apparently. extra beer? Hey now. Look at you, you got them st lined up like jets and shit, man. <laughs> yeah. I've been done with one, you're like, boy, bring me another beer. Stack them, pack them, and rack them. <laughs> um, it was uh, a great show. If you haven't seen it, I, I urge you to go see it. Um, and what else did I do while I was out there? Oh, I fucking, uh, we went to, uh, yesterday was the opening night of the Stanley Cup finals between uh, the Vegas Golden Knights and the Washington that's, Cup. That's a hockey sporting event, It's right? one of those hockey things. <laughs> okay. Just, just curious. I, it was so weird. Thanks, thanks to that, I was not the only person in Vegas wearing a <laughs> hockey jersey. I was surrounded by a bunch of hockey jersey people. So uh, we went to the game, which was fucking spellbinding, breathtaking fucking hockey game. And that Golden Knights story is pretty wonderful. It's real Cinderella. Like, mm. that's a brand new franchise. They got to town. They're the 31st franchise in the NHL. Generally speaking, people don't believe in hockey in the Sun Belt states and stuff like like that. The Kings were outliers. They've been doing it for years and years and years, and, and now, of course, they're cup winners and stuff, and so we can recognize that like hockey can work in some Sun Belt states, but then people will point to something like Arizona, where the Coyotes have never quite taken hold. So the Vegas thing was always going to be a question, and I assume they gave Vegas like uh, the franchise because they're like, well... They get a lot of foot traffic in Vegas, and so, you know, there's always somebody traveling there, so they will be able to sell seats. But the NHL didn't approach it like that. They said to Las Vegas or to Nevada, um, we're going to sell season tickets, and you guys have to buy them. And locals have to buy them, because they wanted it to be a community team, not like just, you know, fucking a thing for tourists to do. So Vegas, never having its own professional athletic team, embraced them in a big bad way they oversold and boom the nhl was like you got a franchise so right before they start playing the season of course is back in uh, october uh, with the shootings uh, happened mm. in vegas and you know crippled the city for a moment broke everybody's heart but uh, the golden knights i guess were very deeply involved in like you know the going forward efforts and stuff like that community outreach and really bonded tightly with the community so much so that the opening night of their games was kind of like a referendum on that shooting and we are Vegas strong and like the community come together. So it's not just as simple as like, oh, they're in a city that's got a new hockey team. This hockey team is its heart. And now I've been to many NHL games and generally speaking, <clears throat> the most enthusiasm or passion you'll ever hear from an audience, a bunch of fans, is up north in Canada. They invented the game, the game is very much there. So I've been to uh, a game in Edmonton where, you know, I was pretty sure they'd blow the roof off. Like, fucking, there was that much power, that much energy, they were that loud. Uh, the game that I went to in fucking Vegas, of all places, was so fucking passionate, so enthusiastic, it brought tears to my eyes. I had no skin in the game. I don't give a fuck about the Caps or the Golden Knights, but at the end of the game, I was in for the Golden Knights. Like, the, the community and the team stole my heart. They are one. Like, it's this in incredible symbiosis, man and they've watched this brand new team who just come to town like back in October 
make this amazing run so much so that they're going after a Stanley Cup in their first year. That's unheard of in, in, in all of fucking sports. So because of that, Vegas loves a winner and stuff. That team's been winning. They love their fucking team. So they won last night. It was fucking huge. It was insane. Being there was being around fandom. You know, here we talk about fandom all the time, and we're fans of the unreal shit and whatnot. So are they. Hockey's <laughs> not real. It's a fucking game. But it's so fucking real that it gave that community something to lean on in its darkest hour, something to come around, like to join, to, to be together around and stuff. So not only was it just a hockey game on one level, and not only was it just, hey, it's a Stanley Cup final game on another level, there is a beauty and a poetry to the story of that team in that city, man. It, it was really special to be there for. It was something that I, we were like, oh shit, game one's happening. I guess we can go do that. We can either play cards or go to that. And I was so glad we paid through the fucking nose to get tickets. Like, I, you know, I called up the NHL because I got connects and shit. And, look, and I'm, I'm Jersey boy. Totally. Literally I was like, look, I'm constantly representing and shit. And I've done lots of stuff for the NHL. So, you know, I'm like, hey, I'm in Vegas. Can I get tickets? Like, we can't help you. So, <laughs> you know, fucking that silent Bob shtick only goes so fucking far. So, paid out for tickets, and they were fucking pricey tickets. And, you know, I wasn't, like, bitching about it, but I was like, oh, fucking, that's, well, I, you know what? I haven't bought hockey tickets really all year, so this takes care of that. But after that game, I underpaid for those tickets. Like, it was, it was one of the greatest games I've ever seen in my life. So they have their next game, like, tomorrow night, but I can't make it out there for that. And hockey people are wonderfully, all sports people, beautifully superstitious. So a bunch of people there, when I was leaving, they're like, you got to come to the next game because we won and it's your fault. <laughs> so I was like, I can't, what do I, how do I tell these Las Vegas, what do you call people from Las Vegas, Las Vegans? Degenerates. <laughs> I just spent 10 minutes building the community up. <laughs> Fucking gamblers. I kid, I kid, I love the Vegas. Vegas strong indeed. Um, it, was, it was a very, very cool night to see. Very, very th cool thing. What have you been up to? <laughs> I did not go to a hockey game. No. Nor did I go to Vegas. <laughs> it's funny, that story reminds me a little bit of, I, uh, I, I am not an overwhelming sport fan. I like basketball because I grew up playing basketball. I like football because I used to like football. Um, but I went, I like baseball for lunch, really. You just go for the food, right? Like you, you show up like, oh, they're going to hit some shit and walk around because it's an agrarian sport. We're going to hang out in a field for a while. We're going to hit a ball. We're going to play catch. I don't know how long is it going to go until it's done. I'm like there's no clock on a baseball game. It just kind of happens. But I went to a game in, a, in Fenway in Boston. Okay. I'm a New Yorker. Uh, we are not usually uh, tolerated very much in Boston. We are actively hunted when you walk into Fenway Park. <laughs> but this was, this was October 2001. Okay. Oh. Yeah. For the so, minute where everybody was super nice to each for other. The, for, the, for that amazing honeymoon phase. Yeah. I remember like, that. It was so crazy. You'd walk around New York and people would be like, oh, excuse me. Yeah. And you were like, what fucking Twilight Zone did I step into? <laughs> But Everyone so in, was just nicer yeah. for a red hot minute. So I'm like in Boston wearing like a Yankees cap and not getting stomped, <laughs> which is always a good thing. But I remember being in, in Fenway and, you know, the seventh inning stretch comes and they sing whatever the seventh inning stretch song is. Is it Sweet Caroline? I think so. I'm not a baseball person, but, but I, I, just, I think I saw a movie with Jimmy Fallon in it. <laughs> <laughs> and Drew Barrymore, and yeah. I think that was part of it. But, uh, but in, the, in the halfway between the eighth inning, yeah they started singing uh, New York, New York. And- Ironic, oh, because of- Because it was just after 9-11. And you cannot imagine what it's like in Fenway Park with a bunch of Boston people singing a New York song. Right. After that moment. Like it, it, is, it is the, like we're rallying in a way because this is the thing we have to rally around. Yeah. Um, I didn't mean to bring the room down. I just had a sports story. But. <laughs> Yeah, you really, we're trying to have a good time here, and you're like, you know. people okay, remember on. September 11th? <laughs> <laughs> that fucking sucked so bad. I mean, I know we got Bin Laden, but fuck. He got us. That was a long goddamn road. <laughs> uh, I have not been at a sporting event. I've been, I've been writing, man. I've been working. What you been working on? I have also been working on a thing that I can't really talk about. That's right. I know what Mark's thing is, and Mark knows what my thing is. That sounds dirtier than I meant it. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen each other's things. Uh, I, I will say, though, mine is 100% blacker than your thing. 
<laughs> that is unironically true on every level. Um, but yeah, so I know what it is, and it's fucking cool. It's very thrilling. You've been working on that. I've been working on it. I've been I've been doing notes from studios that have bought a thing that I did. How and, now? Let me ask you this. Yeah. Which I can't talk about. This is, I know, and we'll try to have this conversation without. And again, it's not because we're like, ooh, we want to keep it from you. Like, we could get fired. Like, mm. essentially, we're at a stage in both of our projects where if we fuck it up, they'd be like, bye, Felicia. <laughs> so, so, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a time and place, but, you know, you want to be able to share. And it's content in your life. When you do as many podcasts as I do, it's like it's tough to not talk about something that that's, that's taking up that much time in your life. So my question to you is this. Yes. The thing that I'm working on. Yes. The IP that I get to play with mm -hmm. is someone else's IP. Correct. Not mine. So I find myself in this process um, very amenable to change and open ideas because I didn't create this stuff. I'm just remixing these materials. The way I described it to the people today was like, I'm not really doing anything except build, like putting together a puzzle. Like you gave me a box and I know what the picture eventually has to look like. I just have to fucking put it together and stuff. But like the pieces are all yours. Without your material, none of the ideas that I'm bringing to it could exist because all of the ideas I have are predicated on the IP, the intellectual mm -hmm. property. Your case, I know this for a fact, is completely original, whole cloth created by you and yours, right. or just you? Who's just me and myself and I. You, yourself, and you. When you're given notes, mm -hmm. like now I'm given notes, I'm like, oh my God, like I don't buck against it at all. I'm like, fuck, I'll make that work. Mm -hmm. or that. And sometimes you're like, oh shit, that's even fucking better. But what that, again, that, it's easy for me because I'm like, well, none of this shit's mom playing with house money. Mm. What is it like when it's your thing and they're like, we want you to do this, and you're like, well, that's not what I want to do at all. <laughs> I think for me, it's, it's always a matter of circling my wagons. It's, it is what uh, Peggy Carter used to say about uh, compromise. Like, compromise where you can, and when you can't, dig in your heels. You know, and say no more, no further. It's what is this thing supposed to be? And to be fair, so that J. Michael Straczynski doesn't pull his hair out, Captain America said it first in the comics, that line, and they appropriated Fair enough. For, for Peggy in the movie, but just, you know. I, I, will, I will rip off a piece of my geek card. There you go, just a little that. touch. But it's, it's remembering why we all fell in love with this thing. Why yes. the people who wanted to buy it wanted to buy it, why I wanted to ride it, why, and hopefully that thing is the same thing, mm -hmm. and then circling the wagons around that. And everything else is negotiable to a certain degree. Where Smart. it's, you don't like that, well, all right, we can talk about this. Why don't you like this? I can find another workaround. But if you don't like what it is, mm -hmm. then we have a fundamental difference of opinion upon which there can be no further conversation. Like, unless right. we're on the same page, unless we both want to make the same thing, then, then I don't see how we can keep going. Hopefully this isn't too irritating for folks. Hopefully there's useful information in it without knowing what the pieces are at play. <laughs> But, it, you know, it is, it's, it's an interesting insight. Like, I guess you do have to go like, look, these are the core principles of the thing, and everything else is malleable. Right. We're up for negotiation, but like, it, if these five things are these five things, fuck it, there's no point in doing it. Totally, like, if it's Robin Hood, there's gotta be a Sherwood Forest, there's gotta be a bow and an arrow, and there's probably gotta be a Sheriff of Nottingham, Otherwise, you can set it in the future if you want. It could be a black dude or a lady. It could be. And um, there better be a Maid Marian or it's gay porn the whole fucking way. <laughs> you got to throw a lady in there somewhere, man. I, that's on effects next summer, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ryan Murphy's Robin Hood. <laughs> um, yeah, so, like wait. There, there are certain immutable things that you can't change. But beyond that, like, if it makes it better. Let's do it. If it doesn't, then I'll try and talk you out of it. But I'm, I'm, I'm an inherently collaborative person. I guess why I do TV. TV is not a one Yeah, you're good show. in a writer's room. And yeah. I mean, right here on the show, whenever we talk, you're able to like take an idea, expound upon it, and find a better idea and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, but it's also like, you know, I wouldn't want to do this by myself because it's nice having another person to talk to and spin ideas off of and, and incorporate and adjust and make one Voltron of ideas. And if you're not going to do that, then... You know, it would just be one sad lion by yourself in the veil. Somebody went, Voltron. <laughs> like, oh, damn it, I'm just... Like, I understood that <laughs> reference. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, well, let's... We got so much to fucking do and so much to get into. Let's dive mm -hmm. in it. But before we go geek, should we address, 
like the fucking top story of the day. <laughs> yeah, man. Holy uh, fuck! It has really very little to do with our world, except I, you know, I I was whole hog on this show and even talked about it on this show. How much mm. I dug it. Um, I flew in from Vegas this morning and I had this meeting in the afternoon about this thing I'm working on. So I had about two hours where I'm like, I'm gonna grab a nap. And I laid down on the bed and then my uh, wife, Jennifer, wakes me up. She goes, get up, it's time for your meeting. And Roseanne's been canceled. <laughs> and so I'm still waking up. I'm like, one of these things isn't true. <laughs> like, <laughs> What are you talking about? And she go. It's, she said uh, she put a racist tweet on Twitter, and and ABC canceled the show. Yeah. And instantly I started chuckling because I'm like, oh silly woman, <laughs> that would never happen. No corporation would ever act that fast. <laughs> like she says crazy things all the time. And plus we live in a country where the president says worse things all the time. There will be no punishment for this. And fucking sure enough. ABC was just like, no, there is. The show's fucking canceled. Yeah. For a minute, for at least the last year, and I ain't laying blame, but like, it feels like for at least the last year or more, somebody erased the fucking lines, and there were no lines anymore, and you could just say the most fucking horrible shit and get away with it. And suddenly, it was like, can you feel a <laughs> brand new day? Like... <laughs> Like there was somebody did something right. Now, you know, you read online, there's a bunch of people going, oh, they only did it because of this and this and fucking the right. show. What are the reasons that, what are the Well, and the, the chief reason, it's, it's one of those like, yes, she, she tweeted an awful horrible thing. ABC is run by a black woman. Maybe don't make racist jokes to the president of your fucking network. To your boss in public, not a good look. But. <laughs> not a good look. And also, she met her boss. It's not oh, yeah. like, like they just hired a new boss or something. Like, right. Like Channing Dungey, is that like Channing Tatum's brother? No, you met that <laughs> black woman. They have you know the same first is. name, they must be brothers. <laughs> That's how that goes, they're clones. <laughs> um, but, but ABC does not own Roseanne. And ownership is a big deal. Carsey Warner. Carsey Warner owns Roseanne. So like, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. will stay on ABC for as long as it has to because ABC owns that show. <laughs> so what you're saying is the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. people can say all the racist <laughs> things they want. <laughs> Agent like, Coulson can really just put it yeah. all out there and shit. And they're like, we own the show. Sorry, folks. Yeah. No, but I get what you're saying. So that could be a... Right. If they'd own the show, and there's no point in going down this road, but if they had owned the show, would they have acted right. as fast? But the point mean, is... It becomes a different conversation when there's real financial stakes involved. Right. They make ad revenue, but they don't make any revenue off of syndication, over international sales, over any of that stuff that makes TV actually go. So they make money. Just not all the money. Not all the money. And some people online are suggesting, well, maybe that was a factor in their right. decisioning or something. You know, the, it premiered huge, like through the roof for broadcast TV, okay. and then dropped off precipitously over the course of the first season. To the point where it's a hit, but it's not a phenomenon by right. the end of it. And well, so, I, yes and no. It is, they're saying, I read an article today going, uh, it is the number three show of the year thus far. So you got fucking football, This Is Us, and like Roseanne. So it's, you know, even if they dropped in ratings, they were still, it's a juggernaut. Yeah. Like, that's why I was fucking stunned that they canceled it. Because I'm like, don't they got 20 million people watching that show? Like, I've, they've worked around scandals before in the past. And it just felt like somebody somewhere was just like enough like yeah. we may lose a buck or two but it's like fucking not worth yeah. it and like roseanne has always been this person but she's managed to for the most part be this person in private yeah and it's you can't be this person in public because hollywood will wash a bunch of shit under the rug we spent 20 years in harvey weinsteinville and didn't know it because hollywood was not motivated in any way to change that action right but when you start tweeting racist shit out and you're owned by ABC, which is owned by Disney, which has to sell a lot of shit to families of all colors, mm. which just... And just had an amazing year. Just had fucking Black Panther make $750 million domestically, bringing a bunch of black people into the Disney fold that might not have been before. And suddenly, Roseanne starts calling people monkeys. Yeah. <laughs> like... They're bringing people in the door and that's your Walmart greeter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, your fountain is over here, sweetheart. <laughs> Fuck, man. Yeah. So, like, it's, it's, you're right. It probably is a decision that would have happened. I've never seen it happen this fast. It's crazy how fast it happened. And, and it just shows you, like, 
how the bar is so fucking low that I was like, oh, you must be wrong. There's no way that they would ever act that fast. Or, and they fucking did. And I don't know. I wonder if that's the... Is that the beginning of something, do you think? I don't know. Or is it an outlier moment? Is it just like, well, it happened to her in that show and that's that? I mean, I think that if, you know, Jeffrey Tambor had been revealed to be as brutally awful on Arrested Development as he was on Transparent. Fuck, man. You know, maybe you, know, you don't get a season shit. five of that. I forgot about that fucking story, and that was only a few <laughs> days ago. Yeah, Jason Bateman is like, thank you. Yeah. Woo. Jason Bateman's like, who fucking said what now? <laughs> Roseanne, I'm off the hook. <laughs> yeah, so they took a bunch of heat as well, man. Yeah, because, you know, they had this roundtable for the New York Times, and they're all sitting there, and, and Jessica Walters is talking about the abuse she took at the mouth, I suppose, of Jeffrey Temple, which is yeah, ver just verbally abusive, verbally abusive, and just kind of awful and mean spirited. And same reasons he got fired off of Transparent was a thing he'd been doing to her specifically for four or five years of that show. Is that right? Yeah. The on only version of the story I got was a, a one like this was a one time outburst. I you know I don't think anybody is a one time outburst person, if, especially if you got fired the last time for being the one time outburst guy. Agreed. Um, so and she's sitting there in this interview crying at having to recount this memory, and Jason Bateman is like, but my friend Jeffrey Tambor is a lovely person. Right. How could he possibly do anything wrong? It's like, dude, there's a woman crying right next to you about what he did to her, and you're concerned about how your other friend, the dude, feels about having been told that he might have been a bad person. Right. It's like, that is not a good look. And of he course, he went online. He took a bunch of heat, and he apologized. He apologized and said, I, you know, after going on Twitter and seeing the reaction of people, I realized I made a bad move. Dude. You kind of got, can't turn to Twitter for attitude adjustments when you're sitting next to this lady who's crying. Yeah, that would be the, <laughs> the, 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 that's the weird part of the whole thing is like, no matter how you feel on the subject, if somebody's, if somebody's that emotionally wrought over it yeah. and you're still trying to mansplain how like, well, this is Hollywood and that's what yeah, happens. We're a family. You know? Yeah. And also, I, for the record, like, look, I, I, I don't work. I never made something as cool as fucking Arrested Development, but I've been working in, in bottom feeding in this business for quite some time. And I don't think you don't, I've never, you don't need shitty people to make fucking good stuff. Like, I've never been a person that's like, well, that, they, they're horrible to everybody, but we'll tolerate that because we're getting great fucking stuff out of that. Um, I mean, I hang out with people that people don't fucking like, like Jason Mewes, but like not. <laughs> Yeah, and we've never been successful, so he's not helping, clearly, but, <laughs> but like, I, I, I just don't agree with that. Like, there was a point made about, like, well, sometimes in making this stuff, you deal with pers different personalities and stuff. Like, I had one experience working on a set with a guy I had to work with whose personality was way different and stuff, and it, it was, the, it, it just made me want to leave the fucking business, because it's like, it's supposed to be fun. Like, you, you know, if you get to be, like, in entertainment for a living, it's like winning the fucking lottery, because you get to make pretend for a living. Like, so, n there should never be an issue. She just fucking count your blessings, keep your mouth shut, and not make life miserable for other people or your fucking self and stuff. It's been a bad week for TV. It's been a bad fucking week for TV. Yeah. Good week, couple of weeks for movies, though. Ah, excellent segue. See as we, we jump into the, <laughs> into the heart just, of our show. Just pull that shit right off the segue. Well done, my friend. <laughs> uh, so butter smooth, it did not need attention called to it. <laughs> And but yet when you we did. Do a good thing. That's, that's true. Sometimes, you know, credit where credit's due. <laughs> um, all right, the show is starting in earnest now, ladies and gentlemen. And we will start by speaking about two gigantic movies in the, in the, the nerdosphere, the geekosphere, or whatever, mm. uh, that came and, and went, kind uh, of, while, while we were away. And we haven't gotten a chance to talk about them. Uh, where do you want to start first? Uh, let's start with Solo. All right. Or do you want to do the old <laughs> that sounded one? that sounded enthusiastic. Such, All such, right, if we have to, <laughs> which kind of seems like based on the box office, what America said to Solo. Like, do you want a ticket to Solo? They're like, "All right." <laughs> <laughs> and then some did not say yeah. that. Could, could I get Deadpool two again? No. Yeah. Oh, All right. All right, Solo. Um, okay, I saw it and I enjoyed it. I, I saw it when I was uh, where? I saw it here, I guess, in an early I screening so. or New York. Here, I saw Avengers in New York. Um, I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. I wrote on Twitter that I thought it was fun fan service, man. Uh, I thought, like, there were great moments. Like, I would not have written the hand meets Chewy scene the way they did, and not because I'm like, my version was better. I'm not that clever. I thought that was a very clever way to fucking do it and stuff. Um, I liked every, 
everything that referenced or tied into the fucking other movies. At one point, they referenced Bosk, and I was like, ah, I have that figure still. Like, um, and of course, when uh, you know the guy who's uh, Darth Maul. Spoilers. I mean, um, yes. Come on, we're in a Star Wars fucking bar. That's true. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a space cantina? Yes, it's hey, a, hey, hey, it's hey. A, it's a not at all uh, unlicensed thing. No. Ne- never mind, it's just a lovely... It's not actionable. It's That's a, what we're it's saying. A, it's an astro brewery. Yes, astro <laughs> brewery. Um, yes, uh, Darth Maul, I had to sit there and do the... First, I was doing backwards mental math because I was going, wait a second, clearly they're not referring to the cartoons because no movies would ever do that. So... <laughs> So I was like, this must be a mistake because I'm in my head, I'm like, when they found, Darth Maul was in Phantom Menace and fucking Anakin Skywalker was just a little boy. Are they saying that fucking Han Solo was older than Anakin? I was trying to do all this mental math. And then I read afterwards like, no man, we're fucking copping to the fact that like in, in the cartoons, that he's been back for a while. So much so that the guy who voices Darth Maul in the cartoons was the guy who voiced him in the movie. They didn't use Peter Serafinowicz. No. They used the guy who does the, who's been doing him in, in uh, Rebels and Clone Wars, I guess, prior to that. So, uh, you know, that to me was like, good for them. Like, why not accept Extended Universe and, and the animated shows that they've done? Because they've built the Star Wars universe and like, to a lot of people, those stories are just as important as fucking Luke and Leia and Han and stuff. Um, that being said, you know, it, it it didn't play like a saga movie. It didn't have to, because it's kind of telling a st- standalone story. Uh, Rogue One gets the edge in a big bad way, because no matter what happens in Rogue One, I, like honestly, it's a tough curve to judge by, because all you remember of Rogue One is the fucking last minute with Darth Vader, and you're like, oh my God, I would, I would fucking let my mother be handed over to cannibals. <laughs> <laughs> so I could watch that one more time, you know. It, it's a it's a one minute of filmdom that makes like the the previous two hours doesn't matter if it was good or bad. It's like fuck, there you go, man. That's well done. And Solo was fun, but it never had that scene, that one scene where you're like, that's why this fucker exists. And I'm certainly not saying it has no reason to exist. It's a fucking movie. It's absolute fucking. It's it's fun. Uh, some people like you know, treat the shit more seriously, like religion, and feel like the movie is an affront to everything that is Star Wars or something. I, you know, I still watch them as movies, and to me it was entertaining. They got me a few times. I didn't, I didn't cry, and that seemed to... I mean, for you. Yeah, that's I know. That's the thing. I was, I put up my tweet, and somebody, like, fucking immediately afterwards, a bunch of people were like, I don't see anything about crying. I guess that's my, that's my two thumbs up. Mm. Like, you know. <laughs> I cried like a bitch all throughout this. <laughs> and then to be fair, I didn't. Like, there were moments like that. I was like, that's awesome. And I was calling out and stuff, but I never, mm. like, reached that teary point or something like that. Um, so I, I, en- I enjoyed it quite a bit. I couldn't understand the box office being what it was, which, you know, is not dismal in the toilet, but it's, it's the lowest Star Wars yeah. opening. Or, As JC said, since Return of the Jedi. And the, only because that's 1983 numbers right. when people were paying a buck fifty for a movie ticket. Right, and there was only like a thousand screens in the country. Yeah, and not because people were like, we're tired of this Star Wars and shit. Uh, it was more just about like, that's the last time Star Wars made this little money was when Star Wars couldn't make any more money because it was the 80s or right. something like that. So some people are, you know, have written the pieces now of like, is Star Wars dead? Is this Star Wars fatigue and shit like that? Um, I, I don't know. I think this poor little movie was, you know, hamstrung from the moment they, they fucking went toward production because you're casting a young Harrison Ford. I thought that kid did a great job, Alden Ehrenreich. He did a great job, but there's the weird thing of we know exactly what young Harrison Ford looked like. Yeah. Also, we know what he looked like as Han Solo. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like... I don't, what? Huh? Yeah. Like, sure. Did he okay. grow another foot over the next few years? <laughs> um, yeah, I was waiting for that line in the movie. Aren't you a little short for a solo? <laughs> but I thought like, you know, in the, when they cast it, there were a bunch of people in the beginning go, why would you fucking do this? And then 
they cast it and they're like, he ain't fucking Harrison Ford. That part of it worked out. Like that was not problematic by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there's nothing in it problematic, but there's also nothing in it that, you know, there's no Darth Vader shows up in the end of Rogue One moment. Um, there's no, I mean, I don't think this is the moment that everyone points to in Last Jedi, but I will, where, you know, fucking, uh, they hype, they jump, take the jump to light speed through the Imperial ship. Shit like that, where you're like, oh, this just felt like it was done correctly. The whole time I was watching the movie, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Yes, they did that. Oh my God, the Kessel Run. Like they, they were ticking boxes. And I thought they ticked their boxes very well. Um, but this is a movie that started life as a different movie and then became the movie that it is now. I, I don't feel there's necessarily proof of that. Like as I watched the movie, I wasn't sitting there going, well, that's the old plot line and this is the new plot line but it was already fraught with complication getting to the screen in the first place. So I don't know if that was a factor. I've read some folks online do a lot of Last Jedi blaming, which I thought was kind of interesting. They feel burned by Last Jedi, and some people are just like, my name's Paul, and this is between y'all, and have stepped off of Star Wars, and maybe that's why it didn't open a show. Which shunk. is weird, because if, you, if your problem was The Last Jedi, which was diverging too greatly from what you thought, the saga should be. Yes. Solo is like the fucking warm blanket of nostalgia of like, look, it's Han Solo. It's Chewie. It's, yeah. the, it's the Falcon. It's Lando. It's all of the things you loved as a kid. We're giving it to you, man. In a bottle. Just suck it up. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> like that milk that comes out of the fucking... No, we're never talking about that yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> that last Jedi titty milk that Luke drank. <laughs> Some sort of sea ostrich. Um... <laughs> What did you think of the flick? Uh, it's funny. I was watching over the weekend. Uh, the Paramount Network had a massive Indiana Jones marathon because they have it, so they did it. And uh, I was watching The Last Crusade, which I like quite a bit. I mean, some people feel it's a little treacly and emotional, but whatever. And the first 15 minutes of that movie yeah. are, hey, did you want to know how Indy got the scar on his chin and when he first used a whip and how he gets afraid of snakes and yeah, gets the hat, all that shit? That's true, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, this belongs in a museum. All of the things you love of Indy in 15 minutes. I'm like, you know what? That's about the amount of time that I need for them to tell this story. And then the rest of it is new story. Like, right. look, I've never, like, too much of this was, like you said, checking boxes. Too much of it felt like, and not even the best version of that, like, Han Solo gets his name from some rando character that we never see before and we'll never see again, and that's how Solo gets Solo? That was honestly, like, you know, I'll, I'll go with you on that. That was the one <laughs> like moment in the movie guy? where I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> You're doing this. All right, huh? well, moving on. Is Chewie here yet? <laughs> <laughs> like, the Kessel Run never seemed to be at all about speed. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, this is Come like on, you're ruining the movie for me now, <laughs> making me think about it. <laughs> the most boring version of the Kessel Run is like, oh, we're just going to drive through the soup for a while. And look, it's going to be like the asteroid scene in Empire, but not as cool. Uh, it's fine. It was. It, it, now that I think about it, it was kind of like, you know, the Kessel Run, maybe because we didn't know what it was. It was just a bunch of words. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when we were kids, like, oh, that sounds fucking badass. But I, I think... and. You, you know, look, in a world of infinite possibility, there could have been a different version of the Kessel Run that didn't involve, like, we got to keep this shit cool or it's going to blow up. That's why right. we're going fast. In my version, when I was a kid, it was a fucking race. It was just, you know, he's yeah. Han Solo. He's got to shoot people for no fucking reason and then <laughs> gives a guy a quarter for it. Like, <laughs> so to me, it was just like some fucking crazy race or something like that. Not like, oh, it had a practical real world mm -hmm. application that then would also help birth the rebellion. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's an aggressively competent movie. You know, like, oh it's- Oh my God. <laughs> I, what a weird insult. <laughs> so much so that you could hear it and be like, thank you, and then be like, wait, wait. a second. <laughs> aggressively competent? Like, it's not doing anything special, but it's doing it, like, pretty good. Yeah, they're all very good at their jobs. Yeah. That's the thing, every player involved, there's nobody to point to to be like, they fucking ruined this, because there's nothing ruined. It's totally entertaining as far as I'm concerned. But that being said, the parts seem... Uh, Greater to, than the sum. Yeah, like they seem to be, like every element is kind of great, and the story itself is just fine. Yeah. But like, it seems like everyone's super game. It was a real charm city with the cast and stuff. 
Uh, yeah, and, and, and yeah, I will say that watching watching this movie, the 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 biggest problem I had with this movie okay. is what it does to A New Hope for me. What? Because A New Hope, the story of Han Solo in A New Hope is uh, man out for himself, scoundrel, smuggler, criminal. He's only doing it for the money. He, you know, there's the moment just before the Death Star run where he takes his money and goes. And you as a viewer, the first time you see that, you're like, yeah, he's that guy. Of course he's going to do that. He's greedy. He wants the money. He's got debts to pay off. He's got a price on his head. He's gone. And then he shows up. And then he's the fucking hero. And that surprise only works if you don't think he's going to do that. Oh, I see what you're saying. So the idea is... Right. You First don't time know. you see that, you're like, holy shit. He He's fucking back. there. The Falcon is here and he saves Luke and let's blow this thing and go home. Like, this is amazing. Because you've never seen a movie in your entire life. And <laughs> Probably <laughs> you're not. Like, oh my God, he came back. <laughs> I never saw it coming. It was the first movie that I ever saw. Like, that's what that did for me. Was, yeah. oh, he's fucking back. Now, if you're a now kid... Now it's like 40 years later, you're like, he's fucking back. I guess. <laughs> but if you watch those movies in order now, if you sit a kid down and Solo's, mm-hmm. you know, not quite the first one you're going to watch, but yes. it's in there, you now fully expect that dude to show up because we're told in this movie, he's a good guy. We're literally told, you're a good guy. What does he do? He doesn't take the coaxium cables shit, whatever. <laughs> he... He literally was like, I could keep it for myself and make money, but no, let's start a rebellion, I guess, maybe, because that's a good idea for me, the smuggler who's, I mean, at least he shoots first, this one. He does. That's not bad. Yes. But, like, the story we're being told is that he's a hero who kind of doesn't want to be, but totally is. Right. And so now, if you get to A New Hope, you expect him to do that, because that's all we've been told he's going to do. I'm like, why would you, like, of all the blanks you could fill in in this story, why would you do that? of all of the things you could affect going forward. Like Rogue One works for me really well because it doesn't in any, it, it heightens the things you knew before but doesn't affect the things you knew before. Right. It slots in perfectly. It is not fucking with your memories of the other stuff. Right. It's just, oh fuck, that's Vader. That's amazing. This is like, but I'm, now there's emotional contours that I didn't have before that don't help. You texted me after you saw, we were going back and forth and you brought up something about uh, Khaleesi. What is her name in this movie? Oh, <laughs> uh, Kira. Kira. Is Kira. That a, um, uh, which I hadn't thought about. Tell them you're Kira. I don't Kira. remember. What did I text you? Fuck, really? That was you just throw ago. away shit ideas. <laughs> like, just crap out good ideas. So many you don't remember. Uh, your oh, point right, right, was right, right, right. you you know where it's going. All right, you you were going off on this tear about fucking like you know it ruins Star Wars because they make him a good guy. Now you expect this kind of shit from him. But you said, and you can see where it's going, like, if they make a sequel, this is before it opened, and who, yeah. it doesn't look like that's likely at this point, but maybe, you know, mm. doesn't mean, they, they could, st- you know, they could double down and be like, fuck you, we're doing it again, solo yeah. again, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> solo again, naturally, that's the name <laughs> of the movie. So Mark was saying that uh, based on the ending with, what is her name, Kira? Kira, yeah. How, you know, it reveals that she's working with Crimson Dawn and stuff like that, that, you said if they did a solo two, she would be killed, and that's what made him that's detach. That's what hardens him. That's what hardens him. Which and I was like, when you said it, and then after I thought about it for three seconds, I was like, oh my God, he's absolutely right. Like yeah. that's the only way that story could go because we never heard her about her again. Mm. And so. that's also what softens him towards tiny brunettes with British accents. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, like I, I, I did not mind the movie at all, but it never, it never argued for its existence in a way that, that Rogue One argues for his existence. I think, uh, again, I don't think anybody, like I don't think you point at people and be like, oh, that's why, or this is why, or this person failed in some way. But I think somebody, uh, Ron Howard deserves some sort of honorable mention. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, the, as a tough ball to pick up, uh, pick up a movie that like, they're taking away from other filmmakers. Um, and he seemed game the entire time. Say what you will about that movie, but he was a very enthusiastic director who was selling the product long before yeah. it was done. Like he was happy to be there. And and yes, it's aggressively competent. You know, I, I would go even further and say it's a well-made flick. It's incredibly well-made. As I watched the movie, I never sat there once and be like. Pfft. I can do better than that, Ron Howard. Not once. Like, <laughs> uh, every step of the way, I was like, you beat me, Opie. It's your world. Go. You know? Like, 
So I think he did a, 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 a wonderful job. He um, rescued a stalemate from the jaws of defeat. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I'll take that. Um, and, and hopefully they don't like, you know, put him in movie jail or kick him out of the club. Hopefully he gets rewarded for coming in and helping him out, even if it didn't turn into the movie they hope it is, and, or it could be. And is it like dead? It's not a disaster, right? Like it's it not made a like almost I mean, it, it made $103 million over the four day weekend, which is still like 50 million shy of Rogue One, which is still 100 million shy of Force Awakens. Right. Um, it's doing okay internationally, but not amazing. Mm. It's, uh, it's now at, let me see. 172 worldwide, so it only made 72 million dollars worldwide, um, internationally, overseas. Which did it open great. in like China? Open or? in China, they don't care. China doesn't care that much about Star Wars. Really? Yeah. Uh, it opened number three in China. Yeah, beat hmm. by other things that aren't Star Wars, which <laughs> shouldn't be possible. That's how they sold the tickets. <laughs> other things that aren't Star Wars. <laughs> I'll take two. But I think that Star Wars, the, the engine of Star Wars for a very long time has been nostalgia. It's always been, <gasps> here's the thing that I've loved since I was a kid and I only get it every so often. You know, like you'd sit in a theater and you'd see the Lucasfilm logo come up and you'd see a long time ago in a galaxy and fucking like, oh my hairs God. would sh shoot so up. So much so that like we were excited to see Phantom Menace. Yeah. Because we saw oh, that. Fuck. And we were like, it's going to be just like we were kids. And I haven't seen this in 20 years. 20 minutes into it, we we're like, oh, go back to that card. The, <laughs> just all I need is the a long time ago part. Yeah, but I've never, I never thought that I would see those words, it's a long time ago, Yes. with such like regularity. Like we're just, we're getting it all the time. We're getting these movies every six months from now. That's an interesting point that I hadn't thought of. You're right, man. It is a nostalgia engine. You can't be nostalgic for something where they're like, here you go. Here's here another you go. One. Here's another one. Do you like Last Jedi? No. Yes. All right. Well, here's another one. Well, like and, it well here, like number one, I don't, th let, let's, let's do this two-parter. Mm -hmm. Is it a problem? And going forward, how would one even correct it? Like you can't shut the Star Wars machine off at this point. They have too much money invested in it. They're opening a fucking theme park that's they all are. based. And again, we shouldn't like, hopefully this isn't a misconstrued as a conversation where it's like, Star Wars is dead, what next? No. Like, you know, they didn't have a, as great an opening as they were hoping for. Still made a fucking hundred million bucks. It did. It, it feels like they need to, not that everybody should steal from Marvel, but Marvel will give you Fucking Avengers, it will cost you $250 million, and then they will give you Ant-Man, which costs them $80 million. Like, they will, they will sort of play both of those levels, and like, all right, we're gonna minimize our exposure with this one, and spend through the roof on that one. So if they, they spent $300 million on Solo. How, what? $300 million before. I mean, the movie looks expensive. It like, looks expensive, but it didn't need to. Oh, but it's, it's 300, because that's not all for that movie. That That's includes the, the previous movie. Yeah, because they shot an entire movie with Miller and Lord directing and canned it and then shot another movie with Ron Howard and that's the one we saw. Right. But you can't spend that much money on a movie like this. Like, guard your fucking wallet a little bit. Do you think we ever, ever see any of the Miller Lord version? Like, I know they'll never release it as a movie, but nope. does footage ever get out? You know, I mean, the one that I want to see the most is Michael K. Williams, Omar from The Wire. He was in the he movie. Was, he was supposed, he was cast as Dryden Voss. He was the what? Of Paul Bettany. That was his role. He was the, the leader of the Crimson Dawn or whatever the fuck. He was that guy. And because he couldn't show back up for reshoots, they had to completely redo that entire role with Paul Bettany. The Paul Bettany stuff felt um, like... We're just gonna yeah. be in this room. That's yeah, it. One set. We can do this in like three days. Yeah, it did. It did have the feeling of like they got through that pretty quick. Yeah, but Omar as that fucking guy. I'd I'd watch that all day. We're never gonna see it. Nope. Um, it is uh, not the end of Star Wars by any stretch of the imagination, is it? No, no. They're but never what's gonna... next? Um, next is Episode Nine. Uh, is the next one we see, and then they are doing a Boba Fett movie. Which they just announced, uh, that got lost in the news a little bit. Yeah. Although the day they announced it, I saw some people like grousing where I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? James Mangold, the great director of fucking Logan, one of the greatest comic book movies Whoa. ever made, not to mention just a fantastic film, mm. is rumored to be handling the Boba Fett movie. Yeah. So if Logan interested you in the least, and if you like good storytelling, it should, 
interest you, it, that's, that's promising to say that like we're going to give the character that nobody really knows that much about other than like, fuck, he looks cool. Um, <laughs> and he died like a punk. To a guy who literally fucking took one of the most beloved characters in the world and spoilers, killed him and we still gave him praise. <laughs> we were still like, you're a genius, man. Like, it's like the fucking kid came over to your house, he took your toys, broke them all, and you were like, good job. <laughs> Because it was just so brilliantly done and stuff. So if you're going to give that guy Boba Fett, you've got... Look, I'm, I'm in the bag for a Boba Fett movie regardless, but hand it to that guy? Fuck, man. We're going in knowing we're going to get a piece of quality entertainment. He's a great filmmaker, man. I love... Do you remember, did you ever see his remake of 410 or 310 to you? Yeah, it's great. It's a really fucking great. It's and really I'm not even a Western guy. It's really great. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they're not going to fire him. I mean, they might fire him. Fire who? <laughs> James Mangold. Because, yeah, I mean, Kathy fires people. Oh, yes. Yeah, that has happened. But do you yeah. think it happens that much anymore? Like, I bet you going forward they don't get rid of people because it's now happened too many times. <laughs> Enough to make a joke where somebody could right. be like, Kathy Comrade has fucking fired more people than... Well, she won't fire that many more because Hollywood is running out of... Uh... I'm writing a joke. Hold on. I know. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to come on top of you, but go ahead. You do that. No, no. I wish you'd kept going because people saw backstage <laughs> as I literally had to look up to figure on, out give, what give my me punchline was. Give me a minute. Um, no, I mean, they're not going to fire James Mangold because uh, it turns out they're We don't even know if he has the job. Like, <laughs> it's just a rumor we heard, but like, it's nice that you're confirming he will He's, not be fired. He will not be fired because <laughs> they're running out of white dudes with beards to hire to direct Star Wars movies. They got one right here, yeah. man. <laughs> I'll shave if I gotta. Um, yeah, that's that sounds fantastic. I, I'm in. I'm yeah. in for that. The, yeah. My favorite pitch that I heard online, a guy named uh, the Art of Coop was his uh, Twitter handle. Was like, I'm down for this movie if it's some uh, kind of know nothing idiot finds the armor outside the Sarlacc pit and then puts it on and pretends to be Boba Fett. And like, what happens when the world fears you as the most dreaded bounty hunter, but you're just a fucking guy? I gotta be honest with you. I don't want that version at all. I will. I will take. Yeah, I will take I'm all happy for the art of Coop having ideas and shit, but I, that's not the version of I Boba Fett I want to see. I, because we got the fucking origin story. We know how we we all saw Attack of the Clones. Oh, he's the son of Jango yeah. Fett. Yeah. Yeah. But what that. else don't you know about him? That's what they're for. Here's how he got his rocket pack, you guys. <laughs> Maybe that's what the whole movie's about. <laughs> the movie's about how the rocket wouldn't come out of his pack and shit. And ultimately, they figure out why at the end of the third act is because it might hurt children. <laughs> <laughs> oh, deep cut. Deep okay. cuts. Um, all right, so <laughs> Solo, I'm thumbs up. I don't want somebody, like, somebody took my tweet, a bunch of people, they were like, well, that's not a fucking rave. Like, he must hate it and shit. Like, they thought I was code, code messaging or whatever the fuck going, like, yeah, I like it a lot. I did enjoy it a lot. So if I had to Ebert and Roper it, or Siskel and Ebert it, I would definitely be thumbs up. What would you be? I'm, 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 I'm not quite... They did know. not have a middle, Mark. They, <laughs> they had up and down. They did not fucking have... They weren't thumbing people. They fucking... <laughs> so I've, which I've, is I've it? I've heard tell about that Roper fella. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? I mean, it's, 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 it's up-ish. Up it's up-ish. It's not awesome, but it's not a crime. But <laughs> it's a movie. When, when did movies become this hard that we can't just be like, we like it, it's good, It's cool, man. I liked it. There's a lot of like, well, up-ish, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, well, I like the other one we're going to talk about. Yeah, let's jump to that, man. Uh, uh, Deadpool happened. Deadpool 2 happened. Yes. While we were gone. And um, it's, it's weird. I mean, I guess like, it can't be surprising because we've seen the first one and mm. stuff. But it's, uh, it's, it's not like making as much noise as I would imagine it would have. Uh, especially with how much we all seem to love the first one. Um, I dug it. But the first 15 minutes, I'll be honest with you, I was like, uh-oh. Like, it, it, it didn't feel like the movie I yeah. was hoping it would be. And not that, like, I had a different movie in my head. It just didn't feel like the last movie. And then about, like, once the cable shit kicked in, suddenly the rest of it kicked in. But the one of the, I, you know, I fucking love the entire concept and I love the entire execution of Deadpool, but my favorite element of Deadpool was his relationship with uh, Vanessa. Is that her name? Yeah. So in this movie... When they fridge her. 
in the first 10 minutes? Yeah, I was like, all right, well, hopefully that changes midway through. I know we're playing with time here. And then it never did. So the fact that they had me as much as they did, even though the movie I came to see wasn't happening. Like, I was looking for more him and her. I like their relationship and stuff. Um, I thought they did a good job. I thought it was funny. Like, uh, I, th- I thought he made some really great fucking jokes. Um, in, in terms of pop culture references, like, I bend a fucking knee. Um, and in terms of action sequences, I thought it was well done. Uh, across the boards, I, I really enjoyed it. But it did not stay with me like Deadpool did. And I right. think that's because of the relationship between Wade and Vanessa and Deadpool that... Like, I don't know, it was insanely fucking touching. That's the relationship you want. Like, it, maybe not, you know, getting pegged, although it looked interesting. But the, uh, <laughs> especially on the right holiday. But the, uh, but it, 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 I, I don't know, like that to me in a, in a, in a story that was, a, 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 you know, a beyond uh, a reasonability, just fucking outlandish as fuck, even for a superhero story, that grounded human element of misfits finding each other, the one person who can look past what you look like, in the case of Wade Wilson, uh, uh, you know, fucking hell, um, and find love, that, w- that's what resonated with me. And I know that if you ask most people, they would not be like, oh, Deadpool, I love it for the love. You know, they, they, <laughs> you're going to Deadpool for the jokes, so Deadpool 2 delivered all, uh, big time on the jokes and stuff. The cable stuff was great. This is watching X Force come to life was really cool, and what they did with them as well, um, come to life and come to death very quickly. But um, but I missed that aspect. It felt like she was in movie jail, and she literally was. And for most of the scenes, like you know, she's just trapped in an, an other place. Um, but that being said, I totally fucking dug it. Definitely thumbs up. But I didn't enjoy it as much as I enjoyed Deadpool for for that reason, because I really thought about it. I was like, how come I'm not thinking about it as much and stuff? And I think it had everything to do with that. Yeah. Um, but it, and certainly not like, don't go fucking see it. Definitely go see it, it's fantastic. But for me, it didn't connect on the level that Deadpool did. You? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it lost me, I think, in the same place it kind of lost you in the beginning, which is I'm, I'm never here for the, let's kill the girl to motivate the boy to do things. Right. Like, she was a full-on character in that first movie. She had, she had motivations and desires and wants, and she wanted Wade, and that's what he was driving towards, and I get all that. Mm-hmm. And so to remove that from this movie left me adrift a little bit. Right. And he never bonded with the kid, which is what they're trying to replace you with, is the idea that, all right, well, Wade, is, he's got to absorb this child into his life, and that's going to let him grow to be a bigger person, and... But because he actively hated the kid until three quarters of the way through the movie, you never got that. So there was no emotional center to it. And without the emotional center, it becomes just references. Yes. Because none of the jokes are coming from character. They're coming from, look at this thing which is like another thing that you already know. Or from another thing that you already like. Even the plot. I mean, the plot is fucking Terminator. It's I gotta go, or Looper. I gotta go back in time and kill this kid who's gonna grow up to become you know, a serial killer. Oh my God, you're right. I haven't so thought about that. Let's do that part. You know, it only picks up again for me, even like enjoyment-wise, when X-Force shows up. That stuff is amazing because it's all from these characters. It's all from Wade's desire to put a family together. It's all from, I, I, I built this unit that I'm going to shed willfully through violence and ridiculousness mm-hmm. and it's, it's fun to watch. But too much of the movie felt a bit like, you know, not quite checking boxes, but just look how smart we are with references we can get and we have all of the X-Men now, spoilers, behind a door, and we're never gonna show you them for just click. I thought that was a cute joke. Yeah. Was it, it was so fast though, I didn't notice. Was it the real cast? Uh, McAvoy and Kelsey Grammer and... Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's yeah. pretty fucking impressive. Yeah, I mean, but I came out of the movie like, you know, that, it's not bad, I mean, they did what they aimed to do and they executed pretty well, but I laughed more at Ragnarok than I did at Deadpool 2. Oh, all right. You know what? You may be right. And all of those jokes are character jokes. They're all from, like, we've known Thor and Loki for so long. We understand their relationship. And so much of this humor is coming from them. Not from, look at the funny shit we're putting in front of them. It's, look what they're doing. Look at how they're relating to each other. Look at how they're relating to going through a devil's anus. Look at, you know, (laughs) the sun's getting real low, buddy. Like, all of that shit is stuff. They did that joke in Deadpool as well. Yeah, they did. (laughs) The sun's getting real low. 
I mean, on the level of just somebody who enjoys fucking jokes about comic book movies and comic books, it fucking hands down easily delivered. But there was a bit of ticking boxes to it. Uh, and, and, you know, of course, it's tough to surprise twice. And, you know, it's, it, it, I think what was surprising about Deadpool was how fucking brilliant it was. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we were hoping to have a good Deadpool movie. We didn't know we'd be given what we were given. It was fantastic. And this felt completely serviceable in terms of like, I was never like, oh, they fucking ruined Deadpool. I'm like, great, another entry, I'm all for it. But that entry just didn't grab me in the heart, in the feels, as the kids say, right. like the first one did. Yeah, but it but made, it made all the money, right? It made all the money. It's now at four hundred ninety-seven million dollars oh, worldwide. My God, um, it still did like fifty million this past weekend and weekend two. Like it's fine. They'll keep making these things. They're gonna make X Force because, of course, they're gonna make X Force with Drew Goddard writing and directing X Force, which is fucking awesome. If you know the Drew Goddard, like Drew, I know Goddard Drew Goddard is the guy who did The Martian, right? He wrote The Martian. And he, he did uh, Daredevil season one. And uh, Cabin in the Woods. Cabin in the Woods, that's yes. it. He's a Joss guy. He's a Joss guy. And a JJ. But now guy. he's his own guy. He's really. very much his own guy. Um, so wait, he's doing? Mm -hmm. Wow. I didn't hear that. What is it exactly? Yeah. Uh, X Force. So wait, the one that we saw in the movie? Yeah, yeah. The exact same one? Well, those characters, those guys. Well, not all of them. Well, most of them came back. Although they're never going to get Brad Pitt. Spoiled. That was awesome. <laughs> that was really cool. That was, that, that was a neat, a neat bit, man. I enjoyed that. Fuck, yeah, I forgot. Now, now you're making me want to see it again. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's a midnight show somewhere. <laughs> um, all right, man. So uh, that's our hot takes on, on those flicks. I'm, th I'm thumbs up on it for sure. Yeah. Um, we got a little bit of news. Yeah, should we dive into the news? We got, we got one we should dive I watch into. something else. I watched something recently where I was like, fuck, I want to talk about it. We'll go on. I'll figure it out later. All right, let's dive into the news. Mark yeah. fucking worked his ass off to curate this news for you by going to Google. So fucking <laughs> I did the get Kessel ready run to run onto the internet. <laughs> That's Mark's very own Kessel Run. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what's going on in the news? Um, so Todd McFarlane, uh, who created Spawn mm -hmm. a thousand years ago and uh, was one of the founding fathers of Image mm -hmm. and that was the launch title that he put out into the world. Uh, there was a movie one time mm -hmm. um, with Michael Jai White. And John Leguizamo as the clown. Indeed. There was a TV show on HBO. Uh, of, of ahead of its time animated yeah. series back in the day. Adult animation from yeah, back in the day. Violent as fuck. Violent as hell. Um, and so now he's making a movie version again. With uh, Blumhouse. With Blumhouse. Which he's been talking about uh, since like Comic-Con. Like I think that's when he announced uh, that it was him and Blumhouse teaming up, which is a great fucking idea. Yeah. So um, he's writing it and he's directing it and they just got Jamie Foxx to star in it. Wow. Yeah. That's fucking huge. That's, that's massive. A, that's a big name for, for that movie, especially because they're doing a kind of lower budget version of that movie. Todd yeah. wants to do it down and dirty. Like, uh, he wants to make it more like The Exorcist or a horror movie. It's like, Todd's favorite movie is The Onion Field. So that tells you, uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, what the fuck is that? That's a movie from the 70s, from the late 70s, early 80s. You don't remember that? No. It's, the Onion Field? Yeah, look it up. It's is a good that a flick, comedy? But it's, a, it's, a, it's like a movie that my farmers? dad loved. Oh, wow. Like it's about like mystery Wicker Man? and intrigue. Is well, he didn't, my dad didn't understand The Wicker Man. Nobody did. <laughs> <laughs> Least of all, Nicolas Cage. <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yes. Um, wait, what were we talking about? Onion Fields. Fields. Yes. Todd McFarlane's favorite movie is The Onion Fields. Is it a prequel so, to The Killing Fields? No, it's a, I, it's a movie about, it's Russia. We'll talk about it after the fucking right, show, fine, Mark. I'm sorry. I'm just, I can't. it's all, my point is, like, it's the least likely movie for a guy who's a visual artist. Okay. Like, it's not like, oh, it's a spellbinding look at, it's a really quiet, drab, like, dialogue driven mystery. Does it have layers? Yes. <laughs> a field of them, Mark. Um, so I will. Ex I, I expect he's not making the version of Spawn that we saw in the '90s in the movies, Don't um, so. with the first CG cape, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. His Spawn, as he describes it, is going to be much more like The Exorcist or something like that. Yeah, there's still hell involved. So yes. much of this is about hell. 
But it's going to be low budget hell. And him catching Jamie Foxx is fucking huge. Oscar winner Jamie Foxx. Yeah. I mean, oh my God. That. They could put that on the spawn yeah. trailer. <laughs> wow. Oscar winner Jamie Foxx. Eisner winner Todd McFarlane. That's true. That's uh, excellent for Todd. Good for him. That's a great piece yeah. of news. He's directing that movie too, and he's very excited about it because this is his own character. Mm -hmm. He created this character. And so he worked on the movie, but he didn't get to direct the movie. So this is big for him to be able to do that. But that's a huge score cast-wise. Good for him. Man. Totally. Fuck. Um, did you ever read the Lock and Key comics? That's by uh, Stephen King's kid. Joe Hill. Joe Hill. Yeah. I didn't, but I'm familiar with them. Um, they have been trying to make a TV show of Lock and Key for almost a decade now. What is the premise of it? Uh, the premise is there's a it's house. It's like the onion field? It is, right, there's, <laughs> it, is, it is like the key chamber where there's, never mind. Were you making a Star Chamber reference? I was making a Star Chamber reference. Wow. I know. Obscure I, 1970s. If I didn't have hat head, I would take my hat off to you. <laughs> that is such a fucking deep cuts reference. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a house in the middle of nowhere that has doors that open into parallel universes, including other people's heads. And uh, they kill a lot of children, I believe. I don't know. Never read the book. Um, I mean, for a guy who's never read the book, you were doing a good job selling it. Right? I was like, I'm going to fucking read that. We should do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they tried to make a, Fox made a pilot about 10 years ago that never went. Uh, they just made a pilot, uh, Carlton Cuse, uh, written by the dude who co-produced Lost with Damon Lindelof, and Joe Hill himself wrote the pilot uh, for Hulu, which they shot, but Hulu didn't pick up, and so now they're taking it to Netflix. Did and Netflix pick it up? Netflix is in aggressive negotiations to pick up the IP. They're gonna do another pilot, they're gonna recast it all, and they're just gonna start Oh, so scratch. they're gonna, they're not even like, oh, we'll take what you did at Hulu. Nope. They're like, we'll just do it again. Yeah, starting over. But even with the same people, just we didn't like that pilot, but we like That's how pilot. much money Netflix has. They're like, oh, you got a pilot? Great, let's just reshoot it from scratch because we were just going to throw this pile of money out. So <laughs> we were going to burn it. Yeah, but for fuel. But yeah. um, well, that's good. Yeah, Fucking right you, on. Did you hear that Netflix is now valued higher than Disney? Really? Yeah. How is that possible? Stock price. Wow. And they wow. don't even have a park. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so true. Um, wow, really? Yeah, that's a thing. Um, that's why Disney wants their app channel, man, in a big bad way. Keep making that donuts. Um, they're making a Watchmen show. Did you read? Uh... I did read about this. How Let's do you feel? talk about this. Well, I, you know, look, I'm, I'm all for. Damon, I think he's very creative. He's also a fellow Jersey boy and stuff like that. But when I heard about the Watchmen HBO series, I said, thank Christ. That's what it always should have been. Take every one of those, make it a single fucking episode and stuff, 12 episode series arc. Like, oh my God, this is gonna be amazing. But now what we've learned is it's, they're not doing the Watchmen. They're not doing Alan Moore's Watchmen, Dave, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' Watchmen story that we all know. They're doing some sort of remix that takes place in the universe of the Watchmen and features the characters, but is not the story that we're familiar with. The right. point being, I guess Damon said something like, look, that was written in the 80s, very Reagan era kind of story that wouldn't fit in, we can't make it fit, so we're gonna do something completely different. So when I heard that, I was like, okay, great, but just then please don't call it Watchmen, you know? like. <laughs> If it's, if it's not gonna be the Watchmen, like, call it anything else. Call it, like, fuck, fucked up heroes. But, you know, I'm not the writer, he is. He could come up with a better name. But, but why call it the Watchmen if you're not gonna do the Watchmen, you know? I mean, his, his perspective is, you know, according to his giant statement he put out on Instagram, um, the original 12 issues are our Old Testament. When the New Testament came along, it did not erase what came before it. Creation, Garden of Eden, Abraham and Isaac, the flood, it all happened, and so it will be with Watchmen. The comedian died. Dan and Lori fell in love. Osmandias saved the world, and Dr. Manhattan left it just after blowing Rorschach to pieces in the bitter cold of Antarctica. To be clear, Watchmen is canon. So they're telling what happens after that. Okay. Yeah. Then but. don't call it Watchmen, you know? <laughs> like, that's all I'm saying. Like, just, Further Adventures of Watchmen? Yeah, because we all know what Watchmen is. It's Watchmen this babies? Thing. Yeah. <laughs> fucking, um, but hey, but I'm, I'm, of course I'll watch it. I'm already paying for HBO, yeah. so they got my money. And they got um, Don Johnson in it. What? And they got Don Johnson in it. Don, Don Johnson. Miami Vice is Don Johnson? The Don Johnson. 
Is in the Watchmen show? He's in the Watchmen show. Do we know who he's playing? Uh, we don't yet. But Don Johnson is in it, Tim Blake Nelson, uh, Regina King, Louis Gossett fucking Jr. Yeah. Whoa, really? Yes. It, that's <laughs> right, man. Oh, shit. Nice. Iron Eagle One is my vision, dude. motherfucker. Bring me the head of Jason Gedrick. <laughs> 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 What is the li- what's the moment? What's the break in the song, man? When he's just like, uh, that what? Uh, I, I had, had a dream, dream when I was young, young, a dream of sweet illusion, a vision of hope and unity, vision of one sweet union, and then it gets fucking like, <laughs> but the down is falling. <laughs> And then we're not going to go Look high. Look what they've no, done to high, my man. dream. Don't, don't That's the high. lyric I was looking for, don't, man. But you don't go high. And then you get in your fucking plane and save your dad. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to launch a raid on Durka Durkistan. <laughs> Just me. Durka Durkistan. <laughs> what will the sign be? <laughs> um, wow. Louis Gossett Jr., man. Yeah. Fucking A. Right on. He's an Academy Award winner for heaven's sake. He really saved. is. And Don Johnson was in a couple of shows once. <laughs> Lieutenant Mayonnaise. That's a good movie that works still, and his performance is fantastic in it. Uh, Officer and Gentleman? Yeah. yeah, really good in that. And he was wonderful in Jaws 3D. <laughs> <laughs> because somebody had to As be. As Calvin Brodus, the guy who runs the park and shit. Calvin Brodus was his name? I think so. Snoop Dogg? Snoop's dad? Oh, maybe I confused him. With... <laughs> maybe Snoop I confused him with Snoop. I think his name was Calvin, because remember at one point he gets on the mic when everyone's going crazy in the park, and he's like, this is Calvin. And he's trying to calm everybody down, even though there's a shark eating people. Um, wow. All right, so wait a second. Even if you do those names again, we can't assign parts to them, because it sounds like Watchmen is canon, but they're not playing with those characters anymore? I mean, Dan and Lori could still be characters, just we're not going to see the Watchmen story. Rorschach could absolutely still be a character. Well, he got killed in The Watchmen, so he can't be a character. He could be narrating his diaries, which did go out into the world again. Fair enough. But isn't that what The Watchmen was all about, narrating his diaries? Theoretically. Yeah. Um, All right. Look, I'm I'm in, man. Fucking, I just can't believe we're in a world where not only did we have a Watchmen movie, but they're like, oh, we're going to do a Watchmen TV show that's not really about The Watchmen. (laughs) It's like, what a brilliant world we're in. Uh, what else you got? That is all the news. That's, That's the, the last news? That's it, my friend. Fuck. Ant-Man and the Wasp trailer dropped. A new teaser. Mm-hmm. Uh, which shows a lot of the same footage that we've seen, but uh, at the same time, they <laughs> reference uh, something. Refer- it sounds like they reference Infinity War. Do they? Yeah, there's uh, some sort of like, we have to save the world or something like that. That I thought was like, oh shit, are they referencing? Are they tying in? Do we know where that stands in the timeline? Like, does it happen after... Infinity War? Uh, I think it happens yeah, before. It happens between? So they reference um, Amy Mockers. They reference, say it again. They reference uh, Civil War. They reference Civil War. And then they reference Amy Mockers in Infinity War. So yes. Kind of like, yeah, we were here. This is what happened in Infinity Wars, but then like on Civil War, this is why I wasn't there. Right. So wait, but Civil War happened before Infinity War. He oh, was sorry, at Civil yeah, War. Vice versa. Right. So Civil War so happened. And in Infinity War, they're like, hey, he's spending time with his kid. Yeah, he's like on house arrest, spending time with his kid type right. of things. So what? I wish my that still doesn't answer my right question. When does you. this fucking movie happen? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is you don't know either, right? <laughs> same, same time, right? It's what it feels like from this latest trailer that... that they are g- acknowledging that half the world's gone, spoilers, half the world's yeah. gone missing or something like that. So I found that intriguing. And uh, fuck, man, like how many months away is that now? It's July, right? So what are we right now, May, mm-hmm. June? We're almost June, so we got like one fucking month till that happens. Yeah. I guess we're gonna start seeing more and more stuff. They're showing more footage of, of ghosts, the character that's mm-hmm. coming through and stuff, walls. Uh, it fucking looks pretty good. I'll go. <laughs> well, don't do us any favors, man. <laughs> it looks fucking fantastic. When's the next DC movie? Is it Aquaman? Yeah. When November, is that? November, December. So we'll probably start seeing something for that soon. I mean, definitely at Comic-Con. 
But yeah. I would imagine before that, with the summer movie season ramping up. What does Warner's have? Is it Ocean's 8? Is there a big summer thing? So we'll be seeing... How appropriate to have an Aquaman trailer on Ocean's right? 8. <laughs> gloop, gloop, gloop. Totally. Unite the Seven. Remember that? Remember that when they released the yeah. image of Aquaman and said, Unite the Seven? Mm -hmm. You were like, the seven what? The Seven Seas? The Justice League? And they never said it. <laughs> I'm still fucking wondering to this day. These mopes? Maybe. Yeah. Um, all right, what else? So that's it for the news? That's it. All right, we're done with the news, kids, which means we come to our favorite part of Fat Man on Batman. That's where we open it up to you, the audience, for Q&A. And we have, do we have? Do we have uh, our tickets? Yeah, tickets back here. Um, Deacon is not here tonight for the show, but Deacon, our good friend who works over at 40X, dropped off a bunch oh, of shit. tickets. We got a lot of stuff to give away today. What else you got? We got t-shirts. Oh. From Solo. Oh, solo t-shirts. Boy, you got a stack. Would you find them in the garbage? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. They're gently worn. No, oh, previously worn. Beautiful. Oh, so, okay, so uh, the idea of the Q&A is this. You ask a question, and if we like that question, uh, you win uh, tickets. We got two tickets here to uh, the 40X Theater uh, at uh, LA Live. If, if you've never seen, yeah, five sets of two tickets. If you've never seen a movie in 40X, uh, do it before you leave this world and shit. It's a pretty impressive way to see a movie. If it snows in the movie, fuck it snows in the movie theater in your seat. <laughs> Is that right? That's right. Thank you. I believe you. Uh, I also got one more thing here. What do you got? I got, I went to that 31 hour fucked up Marvel marathon. Yes. At the El Cap. And at the end of it, they gave everybody a poster. Ooh, let's see. It's oh, a shit. 10 year. It's, it's Marvel Studios, the first 10 years poster with Iron Man, more than a hero, and every character represented. Pretty much. So that's. So this will give away also. All right, man. All right, well, let's do this. We've got five sets of tickets. How many shirts? Five? One, two, three, Beautiful. Five. So with, if, if you get the ticket, if, if we like your question, and the question has to apply uh, to both of us. If you ask shit like, uh, hey, how's Jay? <laughs> then you don't win. <laughs> What's um, happening with Moose Jaws, Kev? <laughs> yeah, you don't win. <laughs> it has to be a question we can both answer. Um, you win tickets, you win a t-shirt, Two tickets, one t-shirt, and the poster will save for the best of the five questions. Ooh, you don't want to do number six? Fuck no. All right, fair enough. <laughs> Gotta go home. I had a heart attack three months ago. <laughs> Can't be standing in a bar all night. Is that gonna be your fucking excuse for every night? Yes, I, absolutely. I, I had a heart attack four years ago. That's true. My wife was just like, you want to fool around? I was like, I had a heart attack three months ago, man. <laughs> um, okay, we got our five sets of tickets. Uh, we've got solo shirts. And we've got the proprietor of this here uh, bar, JC. Give it up for JC. <laughs> JC, the proprietor here at the Scum and Villainy Cantina where we do the show uh, all the time. This is the home of Fat Man on Batman and the home of uh, just good times in general. JC uh, has taken time off from being the bar owner to uh, go into the audience and find people to ask us questions. He's found one. Uh, this is going to be the first question of the night. What is your name, young lady? My name is Sharon. Sharon, give it up for Sharon, everybody. Sharon! Sharon! I love you! All right, man, go ahead. Hit us, Sharon. I'm a huge fan, and my question is not at all good, so I oh, apologize. Oh, shit, so you're not going to win no, anything. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. I'm okay. Fair enough. Go That's ahead. Right. Ask away. I just want to know if there's any updates on Moose Jaws and or Hit Somebody. <laughs> He just told you not to do that. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Moose Jaws and what else? And hit somebody. Hit somebody. Uh, Moose Jaws, uh, we have money for it. Isn't that crazy? It is. That just happened. But awesome. Um, in the last uh, two weeks and stuff. More when I know, and I'll know very soon. Um, and then Hit Somebody is, uh, I did two episodes of Smodcast where uh, I read two of the scripts. And then based on that, somebody heard it and said, ooh, can we do that here? Why don't you bring it here and we'll do it here and we'll do it up and stuff. So uh, it, it's going to become this other thing. And at the same time, uh, Jeremy Simpson, who's the storyboard artist on uh, Flash and Supergirl and Game of Thrones, some, some episodes of Game of Thrones, um, has started uh, doing it as a graphic novel. So, uh, so either way, you're, you're seeing it and you're going to hear it as well. 
And I'm kind of hoping between those two that somebody goes, oh, this could be, this should be a film thing. And then it'll eventually so. wind up as a miniseries. That's awesome. my hope. Thank you. You're welcome, but you win nothing. Give it up for her. <laughs> you win information, the greatest prize of all. Um, okay, JC, find us someone else, another victim. Oh my God, cat ears. I've been to two shows elsewhere, not here in this bar, where I saw cat ears in the real world. Um, one was in fucking New Jersey, and then where was the other one? Purple Hair. And Nashville was the other one, and Purple Hair was there. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, so yeah, man, so fucking, it, I wasn't the only one that left. That's why we haven't had the show for weeks, because Cat Ears was on the road. And so, <laughs> your fault. we can't do a show without her. All right, where are we going? Hey, hey. what's your name? What's up, say? guys? My Hi. name is David. Give it up for David, everybody. <laughs> David, sexy voice David. What's Take up? us there, David. Hey, we got up? tickets and t-shirts. Yeah, by the way, oh, I have gifts for you. You signed my shirt, and I wrote a little note. Can you grab, uh, can you hand me my bag? Uh, I do stand-up, and uh, I have shirts that I sell, and I wanted to give you guys two shirts that I sell Fucking that I think are hilarious. I Thanks, love man. I meant to my friend, not you who owned the bar. Sorry. <laughs> Way to go, friend. So I got two shirts. I don't know what size you are anymore, Kevin. So Big. These are shirts right here for you guys. Oh, it uh, says, I heart. Cut, is cuddling in quotes? Yeah, so if you want, uh, I'll lift, if you lift up the front of the shirt right here, there's a secret message right here. And then you lift it up and it says, uh, I mean finger banging. Right there. <laughs> He's holding it up. I was going to give this to my daughter. <laughs> I'm so glad you pointed out the inside of the shirt. <laughs> Here you go, honey. She's like, finger banging. I like how you think I'm going to pull up my shirt and show off this fucking gun. <laughs> yeah, you gave a fucking shirt Nobody's to a couple heavy dudes. Nobody's finger banging I'm lifting up this shirt. Nobody's ever going to see the other side. Could be a gift for the wife. There yes, you go. Good point. They're My available. wife loves that kind of talk. They're available. <laughs> <laughs> They're available at davidlew.net. So, um... You like to plug stuff, so I appreciate that. No, that was that. good. Smart plug. Anyway, uh, I want to thank... I'll be the guy who does it every show. Thanks you. Thank you for doing this show. It's I fun appreciate show. that. Thank everybody for coming, man. That's uh, a, I love doing it. I've missed doing it for the last month and a half, so it was nice to be able to do it here. Uh, I've talked to people who do Q&As, and generally, I've, the response is they hate doing it. It's like their least favorite thing to do. Oh, really? So the fact that you guys like doing it, and on top of that, it's your like, it just means a lot to us that we're able to like have this... I, I mean, I love Q and A. It's the easiest thing in the world, right? Somebody like literally sets you up. They ask you a question, and then all you have to do is answer them, and right. that's it. Like the negotiation is over. Like, it's, <laughs> it's fantastic. It's, you get exactly what you what you want. And the only problem is when people ask me, like it's a little Q, and then I give a metric fuck ton of A and stuff. <laughs> the problem is I tend to over deliver. Well, I appreciate that, and I just listened to that. Uh, Canadian Q and A where that guy suggested that you had brain, there are people had brain damage. Yes. <laughs> that, that was great. We were just talking about that before the show. The uh, Prince George, Fat Man on Batman that me and Mark did. Uh, we of course is an audio recording, but they also shot it on video, so oh. we were able to put it up on the channel. Yeah. And uh, there was a kid who got up who I guess had brain damage. I didn't know that he didn't certainly. Uh, it wasn't like like oh my god, it's apparent. He just seemed right. like a fan. Uh, very sweet kid. But then his dad gets up like two questions later and his dad's like, that was my son that was asking the question before. Um, he has brain damage. So he was the one that brought it up. He's like, I think the kid said it too. The kid, yeah, I, I thought he was kidding very tail end, yeah. It was but, a sad uh, story, yeah. Yeah, it was a, and, and his dad was like, he is brain damaged and he's a fan of yours, so there must be some correlation there. You know? and so <laughs> it was fantastic. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, mo as a parent, you know, you, it must be heartbreaking on oh. some level for him to have to say that. But he got to a wonderful place, you know, comfy place with it, where he killed the room and Absolutely. instantly broke everyone's heart. And we loved that father to son even more than you know when we just liked his kid. It was really, really nice. Uh, so yeah, so that it's Q and A for me is is easy and fun. I don't know about for you. Oh, I kind of dig it because nobody ever asked me questions. As a yeah. journalist for 25 years, I've been asking people questions for longer than I care to remember. So to not have to ask and to just get to answer, this is awesome. Because I'm lazy as fuck. <laughs> 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 I 
But that wasn't your question. What no, your it question? wasn't. Uh, but yeah, they, they were bringing up, I have a three-year-old, so when they brought that up, I was like, wow, that's a hard thing. And to be able to be t at that situation where you can laugh about it, yeah. I'm a big fan of if you don't laugh, you don't heal. So you got to talk about Very true. the dark. And you, like you've been going through the heart, you had a heart attack. I don't know if you guys knew. Yeah, I don't know if anybody heard, but I had a heart attack. <laughs> but, uh, and I've been going through, my, four years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. Oh, fuck. And, Which kind? Uh, uh, the worst one? <laughs> uh, no, it's not well, competition, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and um, unfortunately, it was stage four. They told me, like, I didn't know it was like, I didn't know how many there were when they told me. I was how like, How many stages are there? Four, apparently. Yeah. Jesus. So, that's like the, yeah, it's a bummer. But I lost 150 pounds. I don't recommend the diet, but I look fucking awesome now. <laughs> And uh, my que this is a way off the... But anyway, we're both going through shit. Anyway, we so uh, my question was, I'm going to school to be a writer. Okay. And this is like a logistic question. Like, it's not exciting at all. But I think about... Because I know actors have to be insurable to be able to act and do, be a part of projects. Do writers have to be insurable? Because I'm worried, like, being sick, like, I won't be hireable. Oh! Do writers need to be insurable? I don't know about writers, but directors need to be. Right. Like, before you go make something, they always make me go to the to the doctor and she grabs your nuts and you're like, oh. and then they're like, you can be in movies. And I'm like, I knew there'd be something like this. <laughs> um, so it, that for directing, I know there's, they make you go to the doctor. I don't think I've ever had to be in any particular healthy condition to be a writer. I don't think so. I don't, you, yeah. do you know anything? I don't, I don't, I mean, maybe if you're on a TV show and the duration of a thing, because writers by and large, their work is done by the time the movie starts. Like, they're only insuring you for the duration of the shoot. Yeah. And they're going to make sure you survive the shoot. They could care less if a writer survives the shoot right. or not. They'd be happier if we didn't ever. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, maybe going into it, somebody might ask, but I don't even know if they actually could ask. Well, I want to be on a staff. Like, I want to write, like, a late, like, I want to be on a comedy show staff. Like, I want to write, like, Right. monologue jokes and stuff like that. So I was always wondering if that's like a... Yeah, I mean, I don't think they could ask you to disclose if you have an illness or not. Huh. Um, therefore, I don't think they could try and insure you because of it. Um, I think you just do it until you can't do it anymore. Right. Um, in which case, forever. Yeah, you're fucking right. Yeah. Uh, also, this is probably impossible, and I'm sure every single person you've ever come across has asked you, I had a bucket list thing of being able to, because one of the first times I smoked weed was Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. Uh, I was not a stoner in high school. I was like, oh, that's for losers, blah, blah, blah. And then my friend who was like, he got, was getting his like, masters and he was like, hey man, we're gonna go, we're gonna smoke, this is Halo 2. And I was like, I like Halo. You're not a loser. And I smoked, I was like, this is awesome. And they're like, we're gonna go watch Jay and Silent Bob. I'm like, I fucking love Jay and Silent Bob. And I got high and I was like, this is even better when you're high. And so. <laughs> Anywho, you probably have a busy schedule. I'm going to ask, just so I can ask, if there's any chance on earth that I could smoke with you this evening. I know that's probably impossible, and every chubby white guy on earth has asked you to smoke with you. I was a fellow fat Mexican-looking guy who would want to smoke with you. You know, I'm skinny, fucking, which is weird. Like, I'm wearing a medium, and that's weird. Uh, so if there's a chance I could smoke with you at some point this evening, just a, not your stuff, my stuff, you know, that's weird. You don't you know me. You brought your own. I brought my own. How polite you're not even asking to hit my weed. No, I have... <laughs> <laughs> I, have pl I drove from Napa for here, so I brought a lot for myself. So... You can smoke your stuff, and I can smoke mine, because you don't know me. You know, whatever. That's true. Um, but, but okay, uh, fuck. And I, you don't I, have to I, answer now. I can't Kinda. say it's a no to the cancer boy. That'd be terrible. <laughs> um, I have a shirt that says that also available on my website, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, yes, after the show, we can uh, grab a quick hit in the back. That was that'll, it. That'll be, that, that's the, that's, well, do you get tickets? Because that's your prize. <laughs> yeah. You absolutely get tickets. Give him uh, give it up for him. He's winning tickets, ladies and gentlemen. Excellent job, man. I'll see you after the show. Oh, by the way, Michael Jackson. All right, we go on to the next Where one, man. Oh, hey, hey, oh shit, he's here. What's your name, man? Mark. Uh, evening, gents. What, Big what? fan. Mark. Sorry, I didn't eat the mic. Mark. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> Sorry. I thought you said Mullock, and I was just Mark like, wow, is what a great I name for the Star Wars bar. Like, I'm Mullock. Awesome. No, Mark? sorry, that's my, name's Mark. Give that's it up my for Mark, British accent. Everybody. I apologize. Oh, okay, excellent. Um, Give it up for Mark, everybody. Mark, what can we do for you? I would like to know, um, 
if you could see a comic oh, book. Oh, so there is an accent yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, so yeah. I, I knew, I, I I knew was, something was fucked up, man. Yeah, I was I, like, it's how weird, do you right? make Mark two syllables because you're British? That's yeah, why. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. We're oh. posh. Calibrating. Um, yeah. If you could see a comic book movie that was set at the time of that comic book character's creation, what movie would that be? Oh, what a great question. If we could see a comic book movie that was based at the time of that character's yeah, like creation. A, like a Batman in the Second World War or a right. 60s Iron Man. Kind of like that Wonder Woman was like set in, in the period of the, that it was set. Um, okay, what would be mine? Um, this is requiring a lot of knowledge for <laughs> character creation. It really is. I, I think I got one, but I'm Go, you off. go first while I think. Uh, I kind of have always wanted to see a Black Lightning set in the 70s. Mm. Like, I feel like Disco Black Lightning would be kind of fucking phenomenal. And then you also do it where like there's the blackout in New York and Black Lightning has to save New York because there's no more power except for one brother in Harlem who can light shit up. <laughs> <laughs> That I would kind of watch, but uh, that, that's, that's my pick. What, what you got? Um, do you want to hear mine? Yeah, I'll hear I got good, I'd like to see, hopefully when this deal all goes through, the Fantastic Four, yes! a 60s based Fantastic Four. Excellent call. All Fantastic chucked Four in. set in the 60s. That's wow, I'm, man, that's that is I'm. good. Let yeah. me see. I don't have that on my list. Um, I mean, I would like to. I, now that I've heard it, I go, oh, that's good. But that didn't spring to mind. Um, all right, origin, story, common creative. What? You got another answer? Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got real answer envy going on between the two of you. What is your second answer? Uh, I think Namor, like a Cold War Namor. Cold War Namor. Cold War Namor yeah. rhymes. Holy right? shit. That'd be fun. Um, all right, that sounds good. Fuck, I still don't have any. <laughs> um, hold on, what is my favorite era? Well, I like the 70s, but Mark took that. <laughs> um, I'm tempted to say 80s Alpha Flight, but that'd be the second show in a row where I referenced Alpha Flight. And <laughs> people will start to realize that I am Canadian. Um, <laughs> it's a good time to be Canadian. It is a great time to be Canadian. Um, fuck, man, I don't know what I would choose. Uh, maybe it's because I'm locked into comics that I'm having this thought, but it is about comics. I don't know, because I can't even say like, oh, the 19 fucking 39 Batman or something like that, because I don't like Batman with the gun you know, without a rogues gallery, fighting dudes in suits, because that's kind of like what it was in the beginning until Bill Finger kind of brought all the great stuff into it. I don't know, I have no fucking answer. You've literally stumped me, man. Fucking well done. Well done, he gets tickets. Excellent job, sir. Take those and take a shirt as well. You don't want uh, 80s Constantine? No. <laughs> No, now that I think about it, not at all. I'm trying. I, it's going to be working like, you know, a fucking program on the background of my phone for the rest of the episode where I'm going, like, what, what is it? Is it Hong Kong Fooey? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Hey, man, what's your name? What's going on, guys? I'm Adam. Hey, Adam. Adam, everyone give it up for Adam. Excellent shirt, Adam. Very appropriate for where we are. What it, is uh, it felt appropriate. That is a manly choice. fucking beard, too, man. Yeah, you, man. that's a well-kept beard. Look at it. Yeah, I try. You know, you know, the very first beard I ever grew, my dad said, who are you trying to be, Kevin Smith? <laughs> you know, I, you should have turned around and told him, no, dad, this is my cum catcher. <laughs> <laughs> I just now nodded. Make jokes. I just went... <laughs> oh, did you? You went silent? Oh, yeah. Shit, that's even cuter. He, uh, he didn't... That's better than mine. Mine's hostile. <laughs> Yours is kind of sweet. Yours yeah. is like... Yeah. He didn't quite get it. He was like, all right, you're fucking quiet. Okay. <laughs> he knew who Kevin Smith was, but he didn't know who Silent Bob was. Oh, I had you... I, I was the weird dude that had you on the wall when I was a kid. So. Right the fuck on, yeah. man. I remember that. I... <laughs> If that poster I could talk, when you Mark. Had me, I was like, "Hey, hey, what's wrong with the bed?" You're like, "I like the wall." 
if that poster could talk and if I could get it off the wall. <laughs> That's haunting. <laughs> And flattering. Do you want a t-shirt time. now? <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I didn't like Solo that much. <laughs> uh, all right, hit us, man. Hit us before this gets weirder. Uh, all right. Um, so I, I recently went through a very similar heart experience. Did you? Not quite as severe, but... How old are you? 27. Oh, was, fuck. So I know. <laughs> that's young. I was sitting there 47 going, this can't be a heart attack. I'm 47. So at 27, it, you must have been like... I was like, oh, shit. I mean, it wasn't as severe, but it was enough to make me be like, I'm coming, Elizabeth. Right. Um, <laughs> it, it made me really reevaluate a lot of things in my life. Mm. Uh, mainly my creative process entirely got rewired. Why I write, what I write, why I'm writing is just completely changed. So my question is, uh, Kevin, having gone through that, has that rewired your creative process? Mm. And Mark, having watched someone that you're close with almost leave this world, has that changed how you approach your work at all? Um, for me, um, it didn't change anything, to be honest with you. I saw on social media afterwards, uh, people were going like, oh fuck, I can't wait to see the next thing he makes, man, because fuck, he lived, and this is gonna change his perspective, and it's gonna be profound and deep, and the next thing we're doing is Jay and Silent Bob reboot. <laughs> so, <laughs> So much for that fucking theory. Um, <laughs> I've always kind of conducted myself and my career uh, bucket list style. Like, you know, clearly I don't fucking hold back, otherwise there would be no yoga hosers and stuff. So I don't spend my life sitting there going like, ooh, I should have, or, you know, if only I would have. I just tend to do it. So there was no moment after nearly dying where I was like, well, now it's time to get fucking serious about shit like because I, I that's my way of working wouldn't change there was nothing that I was ever like oh but now I want to win an Oscar like no it was, it, it's business as usual which I guess some people would find depressing uh, you know and be like how come you're not uh, taking a bigger view or some such shit but I think it's I thought about it a great deal and I think it's largely because I can't go I can't go for broke more than I already do. You can't like look at Tusk and be like, he's playing it safe. You know, like <laughs> it's, I've always just been that way. So the heart attack didn't change that for me. I'm trying to think what the heart attack like did do now three months on. Like it certainly like fucking made me drop weight and shit like that, made me get healthy. So I'm down like almost 40 pounds now. And fucking like it made me stop eating, you know, fucking the uh, animal food products. So. I used to be happy, now I'm a fucking vegan. And, uh, <laughs> but it was more that, it was more like, oh shit, I don't wanna be back here and I don't wanna die, so I'll change the way I physically live my life. But in terms of my work, it, so far it hasn't, I haven't seen it have an effect on that. And I think it's because of the reason I said, you, you and you also had a heart moment had a thing little yourself. baby heart thing. Yeah. Um, I think for me, there's, there's, a line, there's a line in Hamilton, because I'm a, oddly Hamilton nerd, um, he writes day and night like he's running out of time. Mm -hmm. And I realized I think five years ago or so that I had spent most of my career not doing what I wanted to be doing. You know, like I was a journalist, which was great. And I had a lot of fun and I learned a lot. But it was never what I wanted to be doing. Like I wanted to be doing was making shit up, not reporting on real shit that happened. Facts are for the week. Um, and so the idea that, that I'm, there are fewer days ahead than behind is real for me in a big bad way. You know, just if for no other reason than actuarially, like I should probably be dead already. Um, so, Why? Well, the life expectancy, uh, also the out of jail expectancy for black men in America is not overwhelmingly high. One in three black men are behind bars. One in 10 don't make it past 40. You know, and so, especially coming from the Bronx, where I came from, especially my father coming from Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, like I, so much of my life feels like a statistical anomaly, as it is, that I'm waiting for that other shoe to fall, because it's been really good for a really long time, so like, at what point will it turn on me? Mm. And so, the idea that time is not my friend has been manifestly made real in the last couple of years, and so now it's, 
you've been waiting too long. Don't wait anymore. Like, get it out. Get it written. Get it done. What's next? Done is the engine of more. Like, what's the next thing? And so mortality, in a way, has been the thing. And it's not just his, but his was a giant fucking wake-up call. And it wasn't just mine, although, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a good day in the sun. Um, but the idea that, that there are fewer days ahead than there are behind are absolutely making it so that, you know, get it done. Get it done. Do more. Every day you write like you're running out of time. Amen, brother. I love that song. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. You get fucking tickets and a shirt. Give it up for him, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yeah, you get a shirt. Oh! I almost uh -oh. lost all the shirts. Whoever gets the next shirt gets it out it's of like the a, sink. It's like a bar shirt. Uh, hey, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Uh, what's your name? Julia. Everyone give it up for Julia. Hey! hey. Julia is... Yes. Cattier's sister. She was at the Nashville You show. remember, yes, yes, thank you. All right, I have very easy going questions. And now, you. you know what? Hold on, man, what? because fucking, we don't want you going through life as Cattier's sister. Cattier's is Julia's sister. So there you, you call go. me purple hair. <laughs> call me purple hair. Yes. Purple hair. Equals, yes. Purple hair, it's different than Cattier's. We're good. That's true. You All guys right. each got All something. Right. Yes, we are our own people. You man. guys are branding well. But I have two questions because we're a family. I want to ask all our questions. You're representing the entire yes, table. Yes, I sure Fire away. You ready to play the feud? Let's go. Yes, all right. Okay, in Solo, what makes Chewie have a life debt to, to Han? Makes what? Chewie have a life debt to Han, so. Ma makes him have a life debt to basically, Han. Basically, or, or does he even have one? Basically, he could have gotten out of there Did by himself. Did they say anything about that? Was there any reference Chewie to Chewie never death? leaves Han. In other, oh, right, so just, you're just basing it on, like, you think like, he's with him. Chewie could go the fuck away. He even sees other Chewbaccas or whatever. Wookiees, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which one of them like looks very similar to family, Planet of the Apes, by the way. I go see other Kevins. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, so... They've never expressly said that he's got a life debt no. to hand. And but he could have left with his other Wookiees. Yes, he could have. He also could have escaped by himself. Totally. I'm sorry, it's Wookiee so. Kashikian is, is how we... <laughs> I disagree with that, but okay. So um, he could escape by himself. Is it because he got him on the ship? Based on think? Solo? Based on Solo. Well, prior solo. to Solo, I would just say, oh, it's because they're friends. Like, why, why but we hang only out? Why do, holy fuck, I can't answer if you keep talking. Okay, well, <laughs> I can't solve it. Okay. Why does anybody hang out with anybody, you know, at a certain point? So, as, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> um, so, as a kid, I never questioned. I never needed a reason why they hung out. But because you never on, saw holy Solo. Fuck, not done yet, man. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> JC, take the mic, would you? Um... Based on having seen Solo, if I had to then apply okay. Solo to it, I would say because didn't Han technically get Chewie out of a fucking he gave muddy him the jail idea, yes. cell? That's yeah. what I'm asking. Is that I, what you? If I had to guess, it would be like the, I like this you. guy because he fucking saved me from a pit. Kinda. I was gonna yes. eat him, but I was going to. Yeah. But now I'm free. Okay. Okay. They and did. A, it was a nice uh, rancor monster callback. Mm. Like yeah. where you were like, oh fuck, bit, he's yeah. gonna. There's something giant down there, and there was something giant. That's why I really like their meat cute. Like I didn't see that coming. Even when they were like, the uh -huh. thing down there is hungry. It ain't eating days. I was still like, we're gonna see the fucking rancor. And like knowing they have to introduce Chewie sooner or later. Yeah. I still am such a bad writer. I didn't see it fucking coming. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, he's like, Rrr. I'm like, oh shit, Chewie's here. Like. <laughs> so what about you? I mean, it feels like it's one of those things that they might have been counting on a second movie to help sort of clarify. Okay. Um, because it feels as if they're kind of even by the end of this particular movie. Yeah. So, yes. unless Chewie's always wanted to also be the best pilot in the galaxy. <laughs> Did they ever, I mean, I, and I didn't go back and rewatch, but they've never in tandem pulled those fucking... There's lots of hand-holding in Solo. Yeah, like when <laughs> all of a sudden, in order to fly like, the Falcon... Oh, shall we, to, dear? Yes, let's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of strange. That, that seemed added to me. Like, mm. I didn't think that was... They did, there were special modifications? Is that what it was? Also, that Lando fucks his ship, which is another thing. What is it? That Lando's fucking L3 the entire time. <laughs> the robot. Yeah. He's got a battery-operated no, girlfriend and stuff. It yeah, works. It, it works. <laughs> We just got deep insight right there. I don't know, man. Um, yeah, I, I, what did you, we didn't talk about 
Donald Glover that much. No, I, th- there's a moment where, there's a couple moments where you just hear him. Like, there's the Billy D sneaking through, and he's trying really, like, oh, there it is. Mm. I get it. Um, a lot of cape jokes. Which, like, a couple yeah. too many, because capes are fucking cool. Why we got a joke about the cape? The closet full <laughs> of capes. It was kind of cute. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it, he, I thought he, I, I thought he did good, and I, I thought he reminded both him and the other kid Alden. They reminded me of like the Chris Pine school of, you know, yeah. st- working on somebody else's character. Like Chris Pine is not doing an impression of William Shatner, but his performance really calls Kirk to mm-hmm. mind. Like, yeah. and particularly Shatner's performance of Kirk. So, uh, I was. Now I got lost in my point. Yeah. But no, I also, I buy, I buy this Lando as somebody who fucks everything. Uh, yes. Which they really leaned on heavily in the, like, yeah. pre-release marketing. They're like, Lando fucks everything, you hear that? He's buy a ticket, sexual. fuckers, because he'll fuck you. They really sold the pansexuality. Yeah, they tell, you know, stuff. Once again, it works. It, yeah, it worked. It worked. It made better, all the money. You better buckle up, baby. <laughs> No, Come really, on. the line, it works. The line works. It, it all works. The line in the movie, it works. Purple hair's got a thing for it. The line is literally, it works? Yes. How many times you see this fucking movie, man? I, <laughs> I saw it once. I didn't remember that at all. The robot is talking about Lando and her. She's saying, like, and it she works. Says, How would that it works. works. Like, oh, it works. Oh, it yeah. works. And she just says, it works. Holy fuck. Yeah. I, All right. Now Second. I know because you okay. said it nine fucking times, and I'm never going to forget okay. Okay. Yeah. that line. All right. But Second I question. Deadpool. Oh. oh, my God. There's a second All fucking right. question? I'll, st- I'll stop talking. I'm Here done. we go. Second question. So well. at the end of the credits, yes. when he goes back in time, yes. does all that stick, do you think? Or is that just for your entertainment? Oh, great question. Um, it has to stick, right? But I think it's weird. But if you're ever going to jam important information into the post credit sequence in an irreverent way, Deadpool is the movie to get away with it with. Mm-hmm. Any other movie, I would have been like, are you fucking shitting me? Like, they didn't yeah. wrap this up the way I wanted them to. Uh, I thought it was cute that they wrapped it up at all. I thought when, you know, Cable chose to go back in time, he was going to go back in time to that moment where uh, Vanessa gets, spoilers, killed. But instead, he just puts the coin in his pocket and mm-hmm. then leaving the PS sequence of the movie during the credits to have Deadpool be like, if I fix this thing, I can jump all through time. Yes. So I think, it's, I think it holds. Okay. I think it, they absolutely, it's part of their continuity and stuff. And I think very few people could have gotten away with that. But absolutely. because of the nature of that beast, like we, we let it go. I was just relieved that I left the theater and they did go back and do something Absolutely, with Vanessa. Because yes. I was sitting there going, like, you just showed it broke your time heart. travel and fucking, like, you're yeah. not going to go back. And, like, no, that was the first like, thing he did. Yeah. I'll, be back. I'll be dead one day, and then he fucks off. Mm. Well, so I Cable, like what they Couldn't did. Cable have gone back in time and killed the headmaster of that school? Yeah. Like, yeah. that also would have solved everything? And yeah. also, like, saved a bunch of kids from being brutalized by an evil headmaster for decades oh you just made it real man <laughs> <laughs> took it out of comics and took it into like kids got abused <laughs> um, those were good questions uh, great questions right, give it thank up you. give it up for Julia and there's your tickets and get a shirt sure. try to get one that didn't fall in the sink all right now that's a clean one well done man say hi this to cat ears filthy all right, here we go. Is that last question? What's your name, Captain? Michael Day. Everyone, give it up for Mike Hall. What's up? What up? Born and raised in this city. In this, say city? Out to, in this in this shit hole right here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know I can say that because I was born here. Because you were born here in Angelino. Exactly. That's true. Exactly. Most of us are transients. Most of us uh, came here to the Great Salt Lick, but you were born here. I was born in the shit hole. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. You know. But you know, what's up, Mark? What's hey. up, Ken? Hey. How you guys doing? So good. Yeah. Amazing. So born, been here so long. I remember the secret stash back in the day. Back in the day when we yeah. were in uh, when you're uh, in Westwood. Westwood. Exactly. You should take the bus, the number six bus down there to UCLA Get the fuck to out go out down here. there. Yeah. Yeah. I just remember it only being open for like a year or something like that. It was I actually. I think we made it three years with three years. I mean, yeah. It was. Stuff. I remember it was a short period of time or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But I'm Certainly glad the New Jersey one is working years. out and everything for you or whatever. Thank you know. You. Thank you. Yeah. Sweet. Sweet. But uh, my question is, uh, funny you guys mentioned Logan or whatever. Uh, uh, At the end of Logan, uh, my favorite character, I saw the Essex symbol on the briefcase, Nathaniel Essex. 
And my question is, you, you guys know Nathaniel Mr. Essex Mr. is, right? Exactly, one of my favorite fucking characters. Uh, who do you guys think should be playing Mr. Sinister if they do end up bringing him out? John Hamm. Really? I, did, I, I like that you said nice to that. You're like, you didn't hesitate, Smith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You didn't think about it. You that, just that was a little too fucking, fucking quick. You didn't even yeah, answer the other question, quick. but you just came out of the fucking gate like a viper yeah, on that did. one. Truly, but yeah, to be did. fair, my answer to every question is John Hamm. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, okay. I mean, Mr. Sinister, that's, that's, that's a, that's he, a look, character. He's got the look of that he, character. He could pull I, that off. Yeah, with, I think he could. Definitely. I definitely think he could. What about you, Mark? Uh... I mean, I'd be an idiot if I didn't say John Ham. <laughs> Clearly. Hey, man, jump off the ham wagon. There's only room for one of us up there. <laughs> you know, there's enough room in that ham wagon? No, no, no. It's just me and John Ham. Fuck off. I told you. I told you. I creeped him out, right? Like, no. Fucking, I was Tell talking me. to him once at a at a a um, sun. We were up at Sundance, and AMC had an event. And so uh, they, people who were up at Sundance, who were in other things, but also worked for AMC, uh, they brought us in to like for uh, like, not the upfronts, but just kind of like a publicity event and stuff. So John Hamm was there because he was on Mad Men years ago and stuff. I was there because I was still on Comic Book Men, like in the current, and then a few other people. And so I saw Hamm and you know, I've met him at other AMC events and stuff. Very nice guy. But I'd just been deep diving on um, a Mad Men again. And so when I saw him, like he was at the table uh, next to me, and, and we got reintroduced by Josh Sapin, a guy that runs AMC. And he goes, uh, have you ever met Kevin Smith? And he goes, yes, yes, man. How are you? Good to see you again. I said, how are you, sir? I said, I just wanted to tell you, man, I've been deep diving on Mad Men and that fucking final season, like you have some insane moments, man, that were like you just committed and went there. It is so unbelievably real. And I don't identify with that character, right. but there are moments where like I feel like, oh God, that's a Don Draper-esque type fucking uh, right. thought pattern and yeah. stuff. And it's made me change the way that I conduct my daily life because I don't ever want to fucking identify with that character. Mm -hmm. So I'm going on. <laughs> For good like five, and I'm blazed out of my fucking mind. And stuff. Yeah. And he finally has the presence of mind at one point to be like, it was nice talking to you, Kevin. And then fucking walked away. <laughs> and, I really, and then later on, I think, and, and this is me putting two and two together, but I had read that he was like trying to be sober. Like I think he had went to a yeah. rehab or something. So he's trying to put some drinking behind him or something. Mm -hmm. And I think that as he was sitting there talking to me, he's like, clearly he's fucking high. Like, I, I can't be around this. So, you know, he just turned and bolted and shit. And so, and then I That's saw funny. him again last year at uh, IMDB at, at Sundance when I was interviewing people and stuff. He's always a very sweet dude. But yeah, I'm a big fucking fan. I think he's awesome. I wish they'd cast him as Batman and Superman. Yeah, I can. Like, <laughs> and then he could yeah. fight each other and love each other because that's what he I'd has like that to look. See. He, he's tall, you know. He has oh, that he, look. He, he, has, he, has, he has a good yeah. look. I'll give, he has I'll a good give look. you one for real, though. Okay, you got one. I got one. Keanu Reeves. Oh, is Mr. Sinister? Yes. That's fucking good. That's better than mine, and and that's coming. That's I, I coming think I think mine is better fan. than that one. All right, what you got? Uh, Javier Bardem. Oh, <laughs> you beat us both, man. <laughs> That's fucking a good call. I mean, or, or, shit, you're or even about the guy that's, that's just like a hey, choice, friend. Yeah. Um, uh, what, what's his fuck? Um, and no country for old men. No country for old men. Yeah. The, doof, the doof. Yeah. yeah like, he was uh, literally yeah, Mr. Sinister. Yeah. In that he hasn't, I can't think of his name or whatever right yeah, now. What sugar. Was his, thank you. What yeah. Sugar. It? They call him Sugar in that. Yeah. 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 Sugar. Anton Sugar. I say, and also you could do, you know, how like Josh Brolin has a couple of characters, Cable, Anthonos, or whatever. Well, if you did like Benicio del Toro too, as like a Mr. Sinister, and have him as the collector as I well too. I would totally take that. And also we have him in the Star Wars universe now too. Yeah. As, yeah. He's good in that as well too. Yeah, he, fit, he fits that role. He does. Um, yeah, time. I'd be all for that. And, but, but you bring up an excellent point, which we didn't really touch on. Hmm. Uh, uh, J uh, Josh Brolin did a phenomenal job with two separate fucking characters in two major yeah. movies Money. within a month of each other, man. Yep. His Thanos performance drives that movie, which should be called not so much Avengers Infinity War as the Thanos, Thanos movie. Infinity War. 
and his cable performance was really good, really strong, man. Yeah. like pretty damn strong. And I wonder how that, like, do you think there was a discussion at one point? Like, do you think Marvel was like, so, we hear you're gonna be in Deadpool, motherfucker. <laughs> like, <laughs> we invested a lot of time and money in you. Do you, or do you think they were just like, go ahead, enjoy? I mean, it's, it's not technically the same thing, but even though Marvel has a title credit before both of them, mm. but I'm sure it was like, listen, it couldn't hurt. I mean, we'll make all the money before Deadpool anyway. Yeah, I guess. But it's like, you know, with all the fucking actors in the world, like, you had to take our Thanos. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but they got a lot of nice, like, shots in there, a lot of Thanos jokes because of it and stuff. Um, all right, that was a great question, and he yielded a great response. Give it Thank up for him, man. Yeah. He wins tickets, and he wins a, a, a shirt. Pleasure, man, pleasure. So who do we think gets a... Uh, Let's do it your way. We'll do the last question. And last the question poster. is a fancy part. Because I saw you got upset when I was like, let's I'm give not, it to the best question. You're like, hey, man, I sat through 18 movies for that poster. <laughs> <laughs> this is Mark's premium, one of the premiums uh, that came from the recent Marvel Marathon, movie marathon. Indeed. It's right numbered and everything. There's like Infinity a thousand War. versions of those. Oh, yeah. serious? Yeah. So it's a, sign, uh, it's a it's, numbered it's version. It's a numbered print. So that's a sweet fucking prize, man. Do you think you you think you can earn this? Oh no! no now I'm nervous. Like yes. <laughs> that's yes. all pressure. Like, I, I didn't just came around. I come up for solo tickets. I <laughs> Truly, no. Uh, no, no you you look, get no tickets, but now you get a poster. Basically, you can't uh, fuck this up. You could only lose the poster, but <laughs> but whatever you ask will be answered. But if it's good enough, you're gonna win this sweet fucking look at that Ooh. shit, man. <laughs> It is so, a motherfucker could get laid off a poster like this. <laughs> Come into my room. Let me show you my Marvel 10-year anniversary poster. Just sit on the bed. Let's admire it together. Just put it over the Kevin Smith poster you already have there. <laughs> There's only one of those. And for what I heard, it's crusty. <laughs> but what do you paint with? That's the question. Yeah. Ah, it's a uh, stucco, see? <laughs> She's like, I gotta live with this cum. All right, man, what is your question? So, Star Wars, one of the best parts of it for me is the music. Okay. And for Solo, I, it was very unique. It was... Kind Unique of. in as much as like right now I'm struggling to remember it, so I'm like, do you mean forgettable? Exactly. Well, I, I had the, you would always hear these moments when someone would come up and you'd hear the TIE Fighter theme and it was, oh, cool, but there was nothing memorable about it. And Who, I thought that's It wasn't key. Williams? No, it was another guy. And the, remember the credit? John Powell? John Powell. John Powell. John Powell and themes. By, by John, John Williams, Williams, which is going to be the way it is from now on. Like, yeah. he's only doing the he's saga. Doing nine, and, and then that's he's retiring. It. I'm kind of um, curious what your thoughts are about that. If this is kind of the future, what's, how that might affect Well, think Star about Wars. it. In terms of uh, the heavy lifting has been done and was done back in the 70s by John Williams. He gave the films an iconic fucking score that, you know, somebody just has to do a few bars, and you're like, oh, that's fucking Star Wars. So there's an argument to be made of what is Star Wars, and, and you know, as you said, for you, the music is a big part of it. So if you're putting together a modern day Star Wars, clearly your themes, the theme, it's not just your themes of making the, the storytelling, but the theme of the movie itself is key to keeping it within that universe. So stepping back from that, I'm not taking anything away from, what is his name, John Powell? But, um, Somebody has created that work already, and then your job is to adapt it in creative and clever ways so that people are still getting that constant influx of Star Wars. And, and, and there it's subtle. Like, it's not just, here's Han and Chewie in your face, but those themes, you know, when you hear, na, 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 like, it takes you to a place and stuff. So I don't know that, like, I, it's not... Is it great for the creativity of the franchise? You know, to be like, you gotta do Williams over and over and over again? Probably not, I bet you, you know, I'm sure on some level, John Powell was happy to work with those themes, but on another level, it's like, boy, I wish I could do what I feel Star Wars is. But if you're gonna go play in their sandbox, you gotta play with their toys and stuff. So I think 
the music's already been established as far as they're concerned, and the name of the composer doesn't matter as much anymore. And that's, again, not taking anything away from the work of the composers, but for, it's better for their branding if everyone just assumes that it's business as usual. And most people don't stare at the credits that hard, so for most cats, they're like, well, I'm sure it's the same guy who's been doing the music all this time. And only those who kind of, well, well that guy knew it was John Powell. <laughs> I keep pointing to him because I was like, my God, what a Deep Cuts reference. And uh, so I, I, for me, I can see this probably is the way that Star Wars goes from now on. It's not going to be like, and this score is going to be done by this iconic composer. Um, who was the one did Rogue One? Was it Michael G Giacchino? Giacchino? Yeah. And he's kind of like the modern day Danny Elfman to a large degree. He's the guy that winds up doing a bunch of scores and stuff. Um, I think it'll be like that. I think you're gonna have a lot of composers who are like, uh, the reason I'm a composer now is because I grew up listening to John Williams' score. So they'll bite at the chance to fucking do a Star Wars score even though they don't get to create it whole cloth because that's part of the fun. It's like when I write a comic book, like for Marvel or DC, part of the fun is you're playing with their fucking toys. But you know, part of the understanding is that you're not gonna be able to do you 100%. You're gonna have to work within their, the lines that they've drawn. Like you know, fucking, you can't expect to write Spider-Man and have Spider-Man call the lizard a cock smoker. You know, fucking, they're like, we'll let you play with our characters, but you can't do what you normally do with them and stuff. So I think in the score department, it's the same way, where it's like you got a bunch of people who'd be eager to jump at Star Wars because that score is iconic, and they understand coming in the room that like, you're not gonna create the great American novel of music. You're gonna do our stuff, and if you find clever ways to make that Star Wars theme into other things and score other moments, then fantastic, but like, save you for other things, here you come through the door, you're doing John Williams. That's what it feels like to me, you? Yeah, I mean, so much of it, we talked about it before, that, that Star Wars is nostalgia-driven enterprise, and so much of that is the music. Hey, 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 don't say Star Wars and enterprise Shit, in the same sorry. fucking sentence. I don't mean, I mean to fuck it all up. Let's keep our shit straight, all right? I mean, you're not gonna be like adjusting the phasers, density, and you're just, you're not gonna be, you know, bringing, beaming in new versions of your, <laughs> St number one, stop it. Number two, did you, do you watch Cinema Sins? Yes. So Cinema Sins, if you've never seen it on YouTube, is this wonderful, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. They, they essentially take a movie and fucking show you all the things that don't make sense or are funny or ironic or something like that. But in the Cinema Sins for the Last Jedi, they brought up, like he, the guy who hosts it, uh, his voice is wonderful. Um, he brought up the fact that he's like, is this the first Star Wars movie where they bring up the notion of gas, of fuel? Because like a big part of the plot of the movie is uh, we got to get away from the Empire and we only have a little gas. So we're going to slow roll it through space, you know, until <laughs> until the credits. So and he talked about like in the fucking in the cinema sins that like when did Star Wars become this grounded in reality. And it reminded me of in The Last Jedi, there's also that discussion about how the people right, who make the X-Wings and the people that make the TIE Fighters are the same companies. Like, you know, remember that scene where it was just like, hey man, it's war, blah, blah, blah. That's the Benicio yeah. Del Toro scene. So it was weird, like they're introducing, like George Lucas, you know, like, did they ever say how much money Han Solo got for fucking helping? All they showed was, how much? Two now and 15, and did they say what those two were? Like, it could have been two shaved Wookiees and <laughs> 15 more when we come back. Right, Chewie? And he's like Rrr! Do they have a monetary unit in the Star Wars world? Credits. credits. So they just call it the credits. So it, it, in well, episode, episode one is the most mundane fucking movie ever, where it's like, we're about taxation routes and trade federation blockades and... and well, because taxation without representation is really fucking shitty, you guys. So we're going to go to the Senate because we got to have government now because what you really want out of space opera is government. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> they found a way to make that even less exciting than it is in the real world. Hey, kids, you know what's really exciting? Yeah. I know you've missed Darth Vader for a long time, kids. So here he is as a little boy and he's talking politics. <laughs> Enjoy. Um... Did you answer fully? Uh, but nostalgia and music is a, is a primary driver. <laughs> I thought you were like, 
Nostalgia. I'm done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is a driver, and that it, it music really is. is a big totally. part of like the it nostalgia. Just prickles, it tickles your back brain, and suddenly you're there, and you're eight again, and suddenly shit is awesome. Um, it's always going to be that. It's always going to be like songs in the key of Star Wars, and not like, let's get Daft Punk. No, you're not going to get Daft Punk. You're going to get some dude who can write like John Williams. Let's get Fallout Boy, <laughs> and we'll have them redo the theme like they redid that <laughs> Ghostbuster song. <laughs> um, yeah, man, I, I think it's. I think if you want to be a creative composer, if you want to show the world something they've never seen before, then you don't go to Star Wars. Like you're going there because you're like, I became a composer because of these movies when I was a kid, or you're like, hey, I need the money. You know, so some people just take the job for that reason alone. But I would assume most composers, given a world of work they can choose from, particularly like someone like Michael Giacchino, is that how you pronounce yep. it? That dude can do anything he wants. If you're jumping into Star Wars world, you're doing it because you hold affection for it and not because you're like, now I'm gonna fucking do this theme the way it always should have been done, right? Could you imagine if one day they, they release a Star Wars movie yeah. and the big point of contention is like, we changed the music. Like, fuck that old music. <laughs> it's your grandpa's music. You know, so here's the new Star Wars theme. Meow, space is metal. You know, like, <laughs> people are like, boo! It's solo all over again. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would imagine, man, I'd imagine it's gonna be, it's, you know, it's, it's, that's the way the music will go Play from now. The old shit! Yeah, play the old things. Play the fucking Imperial March. It's like going to a Stones concert. They just want to hear the fucking hits and shit. Satisfaction! Like that. <laughs> yeah. um, that was a great question, though. So you do get that poster. Give it up for him, ladies and gentlemen. Well done, man. That yielded a bunch of fucking cool shit to talk about. We're out of shit to give away. Yep. We're out of questions. We're out of news. And that means we're out of show. Have you had a good time, ladies and gentlemen? I cannot thank you enough uh, for coming out. Uh, we love fucking doing this show. It was hard not to do it for the last few weeks and stuff. So it was great to be back and uh, doing it. And thank God we got a place to do it at. Uh, give it up for JC and the Scum and Villainy Cantina, ladies and gentlemen. Not a Star Wars bar. Not a Star Wars bar. <laughs> TM. Just a bar full of Star Wars enthusiasts. And speaking of uh, Star Wars enthusiasts, we can't do this show uh, without the man standing to my left. Give it up for Mr. Mark Bernard. <laughs> and that is Fat Man on Batman for this week. I'm Kevin Smith. I am Mark Bernard. Tune in next week. Same fat time, same fat channels, modcast.com or youtube.com slash Kevin Smith. Good night, everybody.